how are we doing? We're, we're um, at noon. How are we doing in terms of quorum? Um, I don't think we have quorum yet. Kind of count. No, it doesn't look like we do. Okay, we'll wait a few. Still have a ways to go. <laughs> I think it just turned noon body shape. Maybe we wait two minutes and then see. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Crystal, your your backdrop is quite really cool, actually. Thank you. It's like a cool ski resort or something. Is that your dream house, Crystal? Um, no. <laughs> no, no. Do you want to make a confession that you're actually at a ski resort right now? <laughs> Given the heat, I would really like to be. It's true. Yeah. It's crazy down here. It's a little toasty in LA. Toasty and smoky, all of the best things. Great combo. Uh, and don't forget the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> we keep forgetting that. <laughs> Pick your poison. What's that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Are we great? Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's actually really hard to count because there are other people that are not. Com I, I can just take roll and see, but I don't, I don't think we have quorum yet. Right, Vicki and Kim? Well, maybe what we could do is um, before we welcome everyone and, and do the roll call, maybe really quick, Kim, if she's back with us, can start uh, with the housekeeping items. Okay, let me start because uh, I don't know how to do my connection. Yeah, your connection is bad. Maybe, maybe Vicki can do the housekeeping. Yeah, sure, no problem. I'm just going to mute her for right now. <laughs> oh. Kim? Members of the public to legal service. There we go. Okay. Sorry, Kim, if you can hear us. I'm just going to do it since you're breaking out. Um, so uh, welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting. Thank you for joining us. We'll begin uh, shortly. Uh, we're using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please type I have a comment or I have a question in the chat and a message will be sent to the host. Uh, alternatively, you can also use the raise hand feature. In efforts of transparency for all those joining this public meeting, whether by phone or Zoom, we request that you refrain from having side conversations on chat about the content of the meeting. Again, the chat feature is utilized simply as a tool for you to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Um, <clears throat> reminder that going forward, that all Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meetings and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. Um, this is a video conference, so please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Um, if for whatever reason there's some background noise, uh, the host will temporarily mute you and you are able to unmute yourself. Um, if you are dialing in, we just ask that you please mute your own phone. Um, if hosts have to mute you, you are not able to unmute yourself. Um, so please just be aware of that. Uh, if you use your phone to dial into the meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. And lastly, while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. 
Duan, shall we um, try now? We're five minutes after the hour for roll. I'll just do um, a roll call and then just um, kind of the attendance call and then and then see if we have a quorum. Banashe Aglagi? Yes. Eric Iskin? Uh, yes. Amin Al Saraf? Kim Bartleson? Louise Bayes Fightmaster? Yes. Pamela Bennett? Present. Will Bashelli? Present. Erica Connolly? Erica Connolly? Here, sorry. <laughs> Herman Du Bois? Herman Du Bois? He's not here. He said he had to have a physical therapy appointment. Becca Delfino? Corey Friedman? Corey said she'd be 10 to 15 minutes late. Is he here a man? Here. Thank you. Jim Meeker? Here. Deborah Myers? Here. Bob Plantold? Bob, are you here? Rich Rhinus? Here. Kim Savage? Here. Chris Schreiber? Chris Schreiber? He's here. I see him. Yeah, he's he's here. Wondering if he's um having oh, technical I, difficulties. I see him. Okay. I'll, I'll talk to him. Christina Venerelli? Here. Judge Jaskel? Here. Justice Murray? Justice Murray? Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by... Judge Seligman? I'll do our liaisons. Senator Copeland? Present. Bonnie Huff? Bonnie, are you, are you yeah, on the- Yeah, I was on mute. My apologies. I'm here. Deputy Manning? Chris Iglesias? Chris, are you here? I'll do state bar staff. Erica Carroll? Here. Elizabeth Holm? Here. Brady Dewar? Brady, are you on the call? Yes. Thank you. Greg Shin? Here. Christine Holmes? Here. Crystal Bluton? Here. Dan Passamanek? Here. Donna Hershowitz? Here. I'm going to um, uh, count to see there's corn bonnet. Just give me a minute. Duan, really quick. Um, I'm not sure if you got Bob's message in the chat. Uh, he was muted and he's asking for assistance to be able to unmute himself. Uh, but that uh, that would be one more towards corn. Duan, I have 14, including Bob. Give me a second to count. Thank you, Crystal. Also, Justice Murray's joined. Ah, Bob Plain holds here. I have 14 as well. Um, so we have four on body. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and move towards public comments. This is the time that if there's anyone that's joined us uh, on this uh, on this call and you're a member of the public and you'd like to be heard, this would be the time. Okay. Are there members of the public who would like to introduce themselves but um, would not like to make a public comment? I, I don't see okay. anybody. Hearing none, um, let's move forward for uh, the approval of the meeting summary and action items from June 26, 2020. I have one note on that or comment. Yes, please. Um, 
I've been enduring the pain of reviewing uh, Bagley Keene for the past month to try and make sure I understand it. And I noted that it says that votes should be recorded uh, specifically the nays and not in total, everyone who voted yes, no, and not just. Will, I think you might have just uh, frozen up. Can you hear us on your end? He looks like he froze on my end. Yes. Will, you might want to try to um, take your video off. Sometimes that helps with the, um, the feed. But we, we might be able to still hear you if you undo your video. I'm not sure if he can actually hear us any longer. Okay. Dropped off, so he, he might try to call it again. Okay, it just came back. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Will, we, we didn't hear your comments. Yeah, we didn't hear uh, <laughs> the issue oh, of Bagley King. Oh, oh okay. I was just saying that um, votes, I believe, are supposed to be recorded. Everyone's vote, not just the nays and abstentions. Not a summary, but uh, everyone. It was a small note. You, know, you mean a roll Twitter. call? You mean a roll call by name? Correct. The roll call part we are doing, but the um, in how it's recorded is what I'm referring to. And how is it recorded now that that is it not? It's just a summary and of who voted no and abstained. But maybe I'm misinterpreting it. I'll I'll talk to Joanna. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting. I don't want to take any more time. Right, Brady and I can look into that to see if it's done properly. My understanding was that was correct, but but we'll definitely look at. Um, oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Okay. And, so and do for I? For the record, we we do maintain that record. We we have the actual tally sheet, so the record has been preserved. Thank you, Dan. Okay, uh, so do I have a motion for the approval of the meeting summary and action items for June 26th? I'll move. I'll move by Bob Planthold. I'll second. Okay, shall we go into a roll call vote? Aguagi? Yes. 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 Althoroff, Bartleson, Bayless Fightmaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Connolly? Yes. The Voice, Delfino, Friedman, Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Myers? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Rhinus? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Chris, you're, you're on mute. Can you hear us? Chris, you're, you're on mute. Is it just on his end, Duan, or is there something that maybe Vicky on our end might be able to do to help? He said he's on the phone. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute him, but I let me keep poking around. Thank you. Chris, if on your phone you can press star six to try and unmute that way as well. There, I think we got him unmuted here. There we go. How's that? Yes. There we go. Was that a All yes? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Vanarelli? Yes. Give me a second to count. And Dawn, just that's why uh, Corey Freeman's joined. Thank I you. I have 14. Um, Crystal, do you have 14 as well? Yes. Did you want to include um, uh, Corey's vote as well? Um, does that, does that, that would be 15? Um, I have 14 with uh, Corey. Uh, Corey, um, do you vote yes to approve the last action summary? Yes. Okay, so 15. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. 
All right, let's um, move on to recent developments and the chair's reports. Uh, I just have a couple of um, items uh, to share, share out. One is um, with COAF, the um, kind of our, our sister council in the office. We've been in communications and um, they've been gracious to invite us um, into their meeting, their upcoming meeting in August. And uh, we were hoping to also invite them to this meeting. But as you can see from the agenda, it's quite um, full. So we're uh, hoping that they'll accept our invitation and join us in our upcoming uh, next meeting in November. And for us to share out and hear out what they're doing, what we're doing and how we could uh, collaborate more of our, our efforts and our, our uh, resources. Um, and as we're looking at the November meeting, what happens usually um, in this meeting, if we were meeting in person, um, is to acknowledge each other and um, kind of uh, support as we're moving into next, uh, this next term. Some folks would have potentially termed out. Um, that's not the case this year. Well, pretty much nothing's been the case as it used to be this year. Um, and so with that, what I would, I'd really like to take the, the time to acknowledge everyone here and those that aren't here, the staff, the commission members, our liaisons, who I know couldn't join us today, um, Bonnie, Selena, uh, from your organizations. This has been a challenging year, to say the least. Um, the way in which everyone has come together, rolled up their sleeves, um, and given 150%, um, especially the staff, 200%. Um, I just want to acknowledge everyone as we're about to embark upon uh, the next the next term that's before us. We have um, two new commission members who are going to be joining us. Um, I received confirmation from one of them, Jeff Ball, who used to be with us on the commission. Um, and he brings with him uh, his financial background uh, from Long Beach. Uh, so that is very exciting uh, to have uh, that additional, uh, not only experience from the commission, but also that expertise. Um, so with that said, I just wanted to thank all of you um, for all the thoughtfulness, the deliberation, the robust discussions that are all the subcommittees that um, we're also a part of. And um, let's continue shepherding this good work uh, into the new year and to the next term. So with that, um, I know that we don't have Chris and Debbie with us. Uh, I will turn it over to you, Duan, for any staff updates. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to quickly let everyone know that, as you know, we've posted for um, the, the director of the Office of Access and Inclusion for a few months now. Um, interviews are currently under uh, underway. Um, we had um, a, a few rounds of interviews this this week. Um, we're going to move on to our, our final round of interviews. So um, we hope to have somebody in place to announce um, to you soon and, and um, very likely um, before the next November meeting. Um, so if that person is selected in the next couple of weeks, we will definitely email to email everyone um, to let them know. But the candidates are, are very high caliber um, and, and we have a good um, candidate applicant pool. Um, so we'll be, we, we, will, we are very excited to share that with you soon. Um, the other staffing update is, as you know, um, our office is currently hiring um, for two backfill senior program analyst position. Um, that position is posted uh, for both the San Francisco as well as the Los Angeles office. So if you know anybody that's interested, passionate, and kind of engaging in this, uh, the grants work, the diversity and inclusion work, or um, working on more um, access to justice initiatives, um, please definitely um, send, them, send them our way and, and let us know the name of the person um, so that we can make sure um, to follow up on their application. And, and that's uh, all the staffing update I have, Bonnie. Very good, thank you. Um, Carolina, are you with us? IOLTA revenue updates? Yes. Um, just want to check in, Duan, do you want me to share my screen or, or include it? Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a second. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, 
Um, so just very high level, um, providing an update since um, from previous conversations regarding how revenue is going given the current market. Um, during uh, the initial discussions regarding how to project um, revenue um, given the current market and the drop in the federal fund rate, um, we mentioned a few assumptions that there will be a slow transition by banks to decrease their compliance rate. Um, banks that are uh, choosing to um, provide an established compliance rate, so that is a, a compliance rate which is above the federal fund rate, um, holding at a, a base points of 68, uh, um, holding at a rate of 68 base points, um, would eventually begin to uh, reach out to, to the state bar to lower their rate. The other assumption is that we would um, gradually make uh, our way um, through the year um, and banks would begin to lower their rates. So by the end of 2020, um, on average, you'll be seeing lower um, rates close to 16 basis points. And um, slowly, um, we will have a 10% decrease in our revenue uh, for the remainder of the year. Um, the, the positive is that for the past few months, um, we are actually um, reducing our, we've, we've seen reductions around 5%, um, which is a, a, a great because we were assuming a 10% decrease. Um, however, that um, can change as we move along in the year. Our top 10 banks that provide 85% of the revenue are still maintaining an average rate of 54 basis points. So um, we're happy to see that we're not um, uh, dropping too quickly to a base points that are close to 16 or 20 percent. Um, we're continuing to receive donations. Um, so year to date, um, we have uh, approximately 22 um, uh, million dollars uh, that we've collected um, between the bank's revenue and donations. If there's any questions, I can uh, stop sharing. So are we doing, um, I don't know, compared to what we were talking about in June, um, in terms of forecasting the revenue for this year, are we looking at a better picture or a worse one than what we were thinking about in June? You're, you're muted, Carolyn. Uh, we're actually doing well. Um, we are not at that 10% decrease um, per month that we were assuming. But again, that 10% drop in revenue was um, to average. Uh, so we might find that that might change when we get closer to the end of the year. Um, but as of right now, we are we are doing good. Carolina, Richard Reynas has a question. Okay. Hi, Carolina. Uh, is the 54 basis point uh, rate net of bank costs? It is, yes. <clears throat> Any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Carolina. Thank you also for the good news. Uh, okay, let's move on to business and um, Erica and Eric, can you guys walk us through the, I know the bounty that's been before <laughs> um, <laughs> eligibility and budget? Sure, do we, I think we have a, a PowerPoint. Yeah, and then I'll run it through. I'll okay, terrific. So while we're getting that up on the screen, so I, I, I've been the, had the honor of being the chair of the eligibility and budget committee uh, for this 2021 IOLTA application season which we're now concluding, um, and it's been uh, quite a hectic one. We have 106 applicants, um, seven of them are new, and um, spoiler alert, we are going to be recommending that we find 101 of those eligible. Um, I wanted to give some kudos to the staff uh, and also the commissioners, but first the staff. We were working with a compressed review season, as you'll recall, um, this commission, I believe it was the commissioner, maybe it was the eligibility and budget committee, I forget where the approval came from, but we did approve uh, the submission of grants one month on a one month later time frame than we usually do. They're usually due in May. 
uh, this year because of COVID, we allowed the uh, we allowed an additional month to submit applications, uh, and we were also quite liberal about extending the time to provide audits and financial reviews in connection with the applications. Um, uh, but we did not extend the back end time by which we had to make eligibility determinations, which resulted in a compressed review season, which the staff responded to with um, incredible diligence and hard work and worked through the applications very efficiently. We had issues impacting only a relative minority of the applicants. I would say maybe only 20 of them had some kind of an issue. And really, in terms of issues of significance, there were maybe only 10-ish. Uh, with respect to those issues, the significant ones, we had robust commissioner involvement. We set eligibility review conferences for several of the applicants that had significant issues. Um, for each eligibility review conference, we had three commissioners participating, and the commissioners participated um, were, you know, were full on, fully engaged, um, were very active in asking questions and helping to kind of brainstorm the appropriate resolutions um, in helping the committee or the staff actually draft the recommendations that went back to the full committee and presenting those recommendations. And all of that participation resulted in a very wide spread uh, consensus on how to handle the issues. Um, so I think we're all very comfortable with the recommendations that you're going to hear today. And I would also say that the recommendations, even for those applicants, the, the small minority that we're recommending be found ineligible, um, the applicants themselves, I mean, you know, I will see what happens and I, I hate to predict smooth sailing. Um, I've been a lawyer long enough not to do that, but uh, it seems that the applicants generally were actually understanding of where they fell short and, um, and the conversations were largely, I think, cooperative and constructive. So um, uh, kudos to the commissioners and to staff for, for a great season. And I'm gonna turn it over to Erica now to just kind of go through some of the details. Thank you, Eric, uh, for the overview. Um, just to, to take it back to the governing authorities that uh, staff and the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee have been uh, consulting throughout this process, uh, just to give you the framework, the uh, Business and Professions Code Section 6210 to 6228, um, also known as the IOLTA statute, um, is really the basis for this funding and for application review, and then those are complemented by uh, the State Bar Rules for the Legal Services Trust Fund Program. Um, and then we have eligibility guidelines for both uh, legal services projects as well as support centers and those kind of fill in uh, the gaps uh, for organizations when applying for grants um, to help clarify and tease out some of the more nuanced requirements of the statute and the rules. And then we're also guided by the Legal Services Trust Fund Program Standards for Financial Management Systems and Audits, um, which uh, outlines general accounting principles. So the, the main things that staff were looking for and the committee was looking for during application review was whether the 106 applicants met primary purpose. Um, as you know, the um, both qualified legal services projects and support centers need to have either a primary purpose of uh, providing free legal services to indigent persons in the case of legal services projects and support centers have to have a primary purpose of providing free uh, legal training, legal technical assistance, and advocacy support to um, those qualified legal services projects. Um, so we were looking for um, qualified expenditures that uh, help the organizations meet their primary purpose. Uh, we look at the percentage of their expenditures that go to either the legal services or the support services. Um, under the state bar rules, if an organization has uh, qualified expenditures that are 75% or more of their total expen corporate expenditures, they are presumed to meet that primary purpose. Um, but historically, the commission has approved applications where qualified expenditures were between 50 and 75% as well. Um, the commission or the committee takes a, a closer look at those organizations, but historically that has been approved. Um, and then we also look at uh, the organization quality control measures to make sure that um, they're operating in accordance with, with 
uh, the standards and what we look for is, um, <clears throat> or what we compare it to are the American Bar Association standards for the provision of civil legal aid. Um, so for support centers, uh, one of the threshold requirements for them um, in order to receive IELTS and EAF funding is uh, if it's a support center that was not in existence before December 31st, 1980, uh, they have to go through a process called deeming. Um, and it, they have to be deemed of special need by a majority of the legal services projects. Um, each support center that uh, falls into this category has to be deemed every three years. And so this year there were four organizations, uh, Family Violence Pellet Project, Impact Fund, Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, and National Immigration Law Center. That um, it was their year for deeming. And so the Office of Access and Inclusion uh, sends out a survey to the Qualified Legal Services Project, um, and we have 77 QLSPs. We receive responses from, I believe, 62 of them. Um, they only needed a majority uh, to be deemed, and so that would have been 39, but all of these organizations received well over 50 votes uh, saying yes, that they are um, of special need. So all of these organizations passed that threshold requirement this year. Um, so for the pro bono allocation, QLSPs, um, in addition to uh, the allocation for the counties where they operate, um, some of the QLSPs applied for a pro bono allocation, which um, under the statute um, in each county, there is a set percentage, 10% uh, in each county is of funding uh, goes to these projects. And what they have to show under the statutory requirement is that their principal means of delivering legal services is through the recruitment of attorneys and private practice to provide free legal representation to indigent persons. Um, so in order to meet that statutory requirement, there are two steps. One is the threshold criteria, uh, which is shown on the slide, but they have to have recruited at least 30 attorneys or 5% of the licensed attorneys in the county for which they're applying for the allocation. Um, or at least a thousand hours of contributed or donated attorney time. Um, if they pass that threshold requirement, which all of the applicants for the pro bono allocation did this year, um, then there is a test um, for their eligibility for the allocation. There, they can, there's three tests. Two of them are quantitative. Um, test A is that their volunteer attorney hours have to exceed the staff attorney hours. Um, Test B is that their total volunteer time when um, you put together lawyers, paralegals, and law students exceeds uh, the staff time, and that the attorney time, the donated attorney time, has to be at least 50% of the total uh, staff legal service hours. Um, when an organization fails to meet either of those tests, um, they would fall under test C, which is giving them the opportunity to provide a narrative explanation as to why they believe they should still receive this extra funding um, and why they meet the statutory requirements. So this year there were 21 organizations that uh, applied for the pro bono allocation and some of them were in multiple counties. Um, 11 of the 21 were under test C. Uh, the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee reviews, reviewed um, closely all 11 of those applications. Uh, traditionally, organizations that pass test A or B um, are assumed to be eligible for the allocation, um, given that they pass the quantitative uh, test. Um, for the test C applicants, the committee reviewed and discussed all of these and recommended nine of the 11 uh, to be approved for the allocation. Most of those organizations um, either had passed test A and or B in the past, um, came close to passing this year and had a compelling reason why they didn't pass this year, or otherwise had a reasonable explanation. Um, two of the organizations were not recommended to be um, qualifying for the pro bono allocation, and that was Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino. And in that case, that organization had audit findings that uh, cast doubt on the accuracy of the reported uh, donated attorney hours. And in the case of Legal Aid of Marin, um, they provided an explanation for test C, but it was deemed insufficient um, 
for example, when looking at their their staff attorney time to the pro bono attorney time, the ratio was 12 to one. And so it didn't seem to the committee that uh, their principal means of delivery of legal services is through uh, pro bono attorneys. Could, could I add a comment on LASSB, uh, Erica, briefly? So that's an organization that maybe the commissioners recall we spent a lot of time with toward the end of last year because we had a disclosure and we learned that there were significant issues with their internal controls. And one of the problems was their accounting for volunteer hours. Um, we've had extensive series of meetings with, with the newly constant, well, with the board, uh, with the an interim executive director. Now they have a new executive director. The organization does appear to be moving in the right direction, but this pro bono finding um, or the pro bono eligibility for 2021 is based upon pro bono hours that can be uh, reported and verified for 2019. So there's a bit of a gap there in the way this works. And because of the issues that impacted LASSB, their 2019 numbers were just not able to be confirmed. Um, and they actually have an audit finding that was uh, just provided to us that, that that expressly said that they had concerns about those numbers and um, and that they essentially couldn't be relied upon. So that was that was the basis for for the denial of the pro bono allocation for that organization. Even though they are improving and we are generally finding them eligible for an IOLTA allocation uh, under the formula for 2021, they're just not getting the pro bono spiff. <clears throat> The, um, the last thing I wanted to say uh, about the pro bono um, applications is that uh, there was a typo in the, the memo that the commission received. It said that um, 19 applicants are being recommended as eligible for the allocation and two are not. Um, it's actually 18 are being recommended and three are not. Um, one of the organization's community lawyers uh, technically passed, I believe, test A, but the committee is recommending to the commission to find the organization ineligible for any funding in 2021. So I apologize for the typo in the memo. And we will go into more detail about uh, community lawyers in a couple of slides. So a question about parole work arose and uh, whether that would be um, considered civil legal services and if so, um, you know, if we, if that work can be funded um, with IELTA and EAF grants. Um, so that question came up and um, has been addressed by the committee. The, the determination by the state bar was that it should be civil legal services, that this is uh, work that's more administrative than criminal in nature, um, and that it should be qualifying for purposes of IELTA. Um, I don't know if Juan or Brady they have more background than that if either of you want to provide a little more context. Uh, sure, and I, I believe the memorandum um, went out, but um, to briefly summarize the, the conclusion there, um, first of all, there is uh, case law, uh, several um, court of appeals cases that characterize um, parole proceedings before the parole board as civil. Um, and that's also consistent with the statutory definition of a criminal proceeding, uh, which talks about um, the action by which um, uh, guilt and punishment um, is determined. Um, unlike uh, some other sort of uh, post-conviction proceedings, uh, a parole determination does not change one's sentence. Uh, one gets a sentence which includes eligibility for parole, and then that parole finding um, which is before a, a civil board um, is made based on a finding um, not having to do with punishment, um, but having to do with the determination of, of whether um, uh, it would be a threat to public safety to grant parole once parole is eligible. So for those reasons, we concluded um, that, that parole work um, is not criminal, but civil for purposes of IELTA. Um, as Eric mentioned, we had seven new applicants this year. Um, one of this, these organizations is actually a returning applicant, community lawyers, um, but they haven't been funded before. Um, of the seven new applicants, the committee determined that six should participate in eligibility review conferences 
um, and as Eric detailed, several of the committee members uh, participated in each of these um, meeting with the organizations and talking about uh, concerns about their eligibility that arose in their applications. Um, to provide a brief summary about the different eligibility review conferences, community lawyers, as, um, as I said, as a returning applicant, some of the issues that came up with our application was that they didn't provide an independent financial review. And this was not a new issue with this organization. This was actually the reason why they were found not to be eligible last year as well. Um, they were granted an extension in order to provide that financial review, but um, that wasn't completed by the deadline of August 1st. And then in speaking with community lawyers, um, some of the issues that arose were their ability to separate out their non-qualifying work, those, um, the work that would not be considered a qualified expenditure and make appropriate deductions. Uh, there were questions about um, income eligibility, um, whether they were charging for services, and um, just other concerns also about governance issues that they, they had an interim executive director who left during the application process um, and hadn't designated a new executive director. And um, the eligibility review conference provided them feedback and some guidance for future applications, but ultimately the working group and then the committee recommended that they, they not be found eligible this year. Um, their application was incomplete without that financial review um, and then due to the other concerns. And I should say, if anybody from the working group or the committee wants to add comments about any of these eligibility review conferences, please feel free to do that. So the second eligibility review conference was with East Bay Family Defenders. Um, this is an organization doing dependency work in the Bay Area. Uh, the concerns that arose with their application were that they started, they didn't start income screening um, until July 1st of 2020. And so for the purposes of their application, which looks at 2019 numbers, they, they didn't have a way to accurately report uh, their qualified expenditures or to quantify how much of their services were um, devoted to indigent persons. Um, in absence of that, what they did was they used the statistics from another organization, uh, Dependency Advocacy Center. And uh, what Dependency Advocacy Center had as their number was 15% of their work was, was non-qualifying. And so East Bay Family Defenders applied that percentage to their own work and made deductions based on that percentage. Um, but in discussing it further with them, the working group determined that the, the two organizations are not uh, sufficiently similar um, in order to make that an applicable um, percentage. So uh, that was the main reason to recommend that they be found ineligible this year, but um, it does seem that they have a system in place in order to hopefully have uh, more accurate numbers in future applications. The other thing that came up with this organization was that um, some of their work, whether it was could be considered legal services, they have social workers on staff and uh, parent advocate support. And so uh, they were, uh, that was discussed further with them. Uh, and I think the working group was satisfied that that work could be considered to the legal services because it was connected to the legal outcomes um, and uh, intertwined essentially with the legal case. Um, but ultimately because they don't have the required uh, methodology for um, figuring out the qualified expenditures. That's why they're recommended as ineligible this year. Uh, next was Housing Rights Center. Um, so this organization is located in Los Angeles and provides uh, housing discrimination complaint investigation. They have a landlord tenant counseling service. They do education and outreach on housing rights issues. And then they also have a legal department, uh, which uh, will take up housing discrimination claims. Um, the issues that arose for this organization were an incomplete application. Um, upon submission of their application, it was missing uh, any details about their qualified expenditures um, and staff worked with them to uh, try to get some more information. But by the time of the eligibility review conference, there was still uh, gaps in our understanding about whether they uh, were qualified or not. Um, the working group spoke with them about their ability to make appropriate deductions for uh, example, providing services to individuals who might not be considered indigent. Um, there was also discussion about whether their landlord tenant counseling or some of their 
uh, discrimination investigation would be considered legal services. Um, this organization was given an extension to uh, provide the requested information in order to uh, figure out the percentage and amount of their qualified expenditures. Uh, they were unable to meet that deadline, and so the working group and the committee recommended that they be found ineligible this year um, for an incomplete application. Then Kids in Need of Defense um, is an organization that primarily provides services to um, undocumented children, unaccompanied minors, uh, mostly immigration services. They are a national organization. They have several offices uh, throughout the country. Um, they're not incorporated in California, which is a requirement for funding. Um, so they did not meet that threshold requirement. And then given the number of offices that they have um, outside of the state, their qualified expenditures fell below 50%. Uh, they requested an audit um, extension. They were unable to meet the audit extension deadline of August 1st, which the committee had uh, granted to everyone who requested an extension. Um, and so in speaking with, uh, with KIND, the working group um, communicated to them because of these threshold issues that uh, they didn't think they could find them eligible this year. Um, KIND indicated that they don't intend on incorporating or doing a spinoff or incorporating in California. Um, so it's unclear whether they will return uh, to apply for funding in the future. But Social Justice Collaborative um, provides uh, mostly immigration services as well. Um, the main issues that came up with their application were, while they were above 50%, they did have low qualified expenditures. Uh, they reported that they did have to charge for some of their services, uh, that they, they aim to provide free services, but that um, some of their services, for example, when there are uh, children um, where the client is in California, but children are outside of the state or outside of the country, they don't have funding for that and may need to charge uh, in order to assist the whole family. Um, in speaking with the working group, uh, they discussed their methodology for uh, figuring out their qualified expenditures. They showed us the chart that they use, which um, they apply the 125% of the federal poverty level um, and that they, um, they had a spreadsheet that demonstrated that they, they are applying appropriate uh, calculations to have accurate deductions from their qualified expenditures. Um, but uh, the working group in discussing with them and in the documentation that they provided for support was satisfied that they, they do have appropriate uh, deductions for their qualified expenditures. And they are confident that now that if they are found eligible, which is the recommendation that um, their qualified expenditures will actually increase because they will have funding um, for some of the services that they otherwise would. Oh preferred not to charge for, but, but have to at this point. Yeah. Uncommon Law is an organization that primarily engages in parole work, um, which as Brady discussed, uh, the question arose before we had an answer to it about whether parole work could be considered civil legal services and be funded. So um, that question was resolved and then there was also uh, questions about the organization's wraparound or ancillary services, uh, supportive services to individuals who are released on parole and in preparation for their parole hearings. Um, and the working group found that to the extent that these services are provided and again are supportive um, and integral to the legal outcome that Uncommon Law is trying to achieve, um, that it should be considered legal services. And so the recommendation on this organization was to find them eligible. And then the last uh, applicant was USC Gould's uh, Immigration Law Clinic. This organization, um, uh, under the statute and the rules, uh, there is an independent auditor financial review requirement. Um, this organization didn't satisfy that. Uh, they were unable to provide a independently reviewed statement regarding their expenditures in the past fiscal year. They did provide an audit for the entire university um, for USC, uh, but that, that audit did not indicate any of the expenditures related to the law pool or the law 
clinic um, and staff had no way of being able to verify that the expenditures they were reporting um, were accurate. They did, they did provide a, a schedule of their expenditures, but it was produced internally. Um, and so staff didn't recommend them to be found eligible this year because uh, they failed to meet that threshold requirement. This is Rich. Uh, in the mm -hmm. past, we've had hospitals and law schools uh, encounter the same accounting problem. Uh, how have we solved it in the past? And I, I thought we actually had um, created a carve out for law schools and hospitals that engage in civil legal work uh, uh, as it otherwise meets our requirements. Uh, because they had uh, accounting difficulties separating out the expenditures incurred with respect to only their uh, venture? I can answer that, um, Rich. Um, so we, we do have a carve out, as Rich is saying, a, a, a more of a, an office practice to kind of address um, the statutory limitations. Um, the statute provides that an organization has to provide an, either an audited um, a, a, an audit or a, a financial review. Um, it doesn't contemplate this. I mean, it, there's a carve out for law schools, but it doesn't, um, uh, the, the statute doesn't go into um, how a law school is able to obtain that because in working with law school clinics, um, the CPA is not, uh, it, it cannot provide um, a separate audit for just the clinic because they're not a separate uh, 501c3 organization. To, to kind of get around that, this commission um, in past years has accepted um, the kind of the university audit and a separate schedule of the clinic itself, but that schedule needs to be audited. So that's, that's kind of the, the go around um, to satisfy the audit requirement, um, but still provide us what we need. And Sim this we were not able to provide that separate um, additionally scheduled audit for that particular law, law, law school clinic. Duan, uh, this is Rich again. I, I'd recommend that the uh, staff uh, take a hard look at how we might enable uh, law school clinics and uh, other similar institutions to qualify given their accounting limitations um, because I'm sure if uh, we were to do a forensic accounting, we would be able to qualify this applicant and others like it. Uh, and the carve out ought not to be an office policy, but in fact a written policy so that future applicants in this category could qualify. Yes, and this definitely yeah. is this for codification and, and Brady was just saying um, perhaps this one may um, move kind of independently um, through codification without waiting for the entire package um, because it is one that um, the office practice could probably be codified uh, without any controversy. Yeah and, and we took a look at this one specifically and um, this USC Gold Immigration Law Clinic what, what they gave us fails the um, fails what our written policies are um, you know, they didn't, they didn't provide the schedule and the audit that they did provide the university level audit. It, it doesn't have a, it's, it's so high level. It doesn't have a line item for the law school, let alone, um, let alone this clinic. So as far as uh, getting any auditor verified information about this clinic, um, there was none in what they provided. Well, can I have a clarification there? You said they did not provide a schedule. I thought they did provide a schedule. It just was not audited. Correct. Their schedule was uh, okay. internally produced. So the, the schedule, okay, so schedule but it has to be audited. That, that's, that's the kind of a, it, we, we feel like that's, um, you know, in line with what the statutory requirements, but giving that extra flexibility because of a, in a law school clinic. And is, is there some reason to believe that the audit of the entire school would miss uh, problems with the law school schedule? It, it, it's not that. Sense? It's just like usually um, with the, the schedule, um, if the schedule had been audited um, by CPA, it itemizes that now. With the, with the university audit, um, it's, it's, you, you cannot determine expenditures. There's not, as Brady was saying, even a line item for the law school itself, much less the clinic. There's no way for us to uh, verify um, the expenditures. It's, it's, you know, it, it goes into the, the, the expenditures of the law school, uh, of the university in general, and it's over a hundred or two hundred million dollars, I believe. Um, this is a, a very small subject of the university. There is no way for us to, uh, to verify it from, from that, that audit. Oh, okay. 
And, and they refuse to provide that. Exactly, exactly. Because right now what they provide is, is just internal kind of bookkeeping um, schedules um, and that's not verifiable. The, 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 yeah, the rule is that it has to be, um, you know, uh, produced by- right. Yeah, I understand that piece. I was just making sure that they had been offered the opportunity to provide it and they declined. Okay. No, they were given an extension and, and so they, they were working towards that extension, but, but just they, they, they couldn't get it um, in time and they have expressed ban um, that they will uh, reapply next year. And we have no other um, uh, kind of uh, pending issues with them. And we expect if they do apply and that they provide the correct docking, um, audit, um, it, it shouldn't be a problem um, to, to meet primary purpose next year. I would say every one of these that are no's involved a lot of staff handholding and efforts to see what we could do to help the organization get over the line. And in several cases you see they did and others they didn't. But we're comfortable with the, uh, in the situations where we feel that they didn't, we're comfortable that that's the right answer. Is there anything further, Erica, in your presentation? Yes. No. Um, Duan, sorry, can you just go back to the, the last slide quickly? Um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, this list of the seven new applicants, five are being recommended as ineligible, and those are the only ones that the committee are recommending as ineligible at this point. Um, to the extent that the commission agrees with that, not, the office will be sending out determination letters uh, after this meeting and those organizations um, would be given 30 days from the receipt of those letters to appeal. Um, if we receive any requests for an appeal, we'll certainly inform the commission as soon as possible. So. And also just um, um, kind of logistically speaking, um, our next meeting isn't until um, November. If we do happen to, um, you know, uh, the commission agrees with these determination we send out the determination letters and there is an appeal we would definitely forward that on to you um, as soon as possible and then reconvene sooner than november it's my understanding though that all of those that that our understanding is that those who have been deemed ineligible um understand and, and aren't challenged have not yet expressed any any disagreement with our with our findings or recommendations that's correct as far as i'm as far as i, I know should i move on to okay go. yes please thanks um so an, an issue that arose um was that Several organizations required audit extensions. Typically, the audit or the financial review would need to be submitted, um, you know, prior to or along with the application. Staff had uh, the authority to extend the deadline up to the application deadline of June 15th, which we did. Um, but then we received, I believe, 17 requests uh, for audit extensions beyond that. Um, the committee reviewed those requests and approved all of them up through August 1st. Uh, most organizations were able to provide their, their final um, audits by that date, um, but we do have two organizations that were unable to and have reached out to us um, to request further extension. Um, and I should say the difference between the audit and the financial review is um, organizations that have corporate expenditures of 500000 or less are permitted to provide a financial review instead of an audit. Um, and that's the main distinction, but the timelines are the same. And so we received a request from Family Legal Assistance at Chalk Children, um, which is an organization that needs to submit a financial review. They weren't able to meet the deadline and uh, said that they could attempt to meet August 31st. Um, we haven't received any documentation from them yet. Um, the numbers that they have reported in their application are, are based on their own estimates. Um, and so what the committee decided uh, to recommend to the commission was to grant that extension to August 31st, but should Chalk fail to meet that August 31st deadline, um, that they would recommend that they be found ineligible for 2021 funding. Um, if they are able to meet the deadline, because the Office of Access and Inclusion needs to start uh, preparing 
running the allocation formula and uh, sending out uh, tentative allocations and the budget forms. If, uh, if chalk is able to meet the August 31st deadline, then if their expenditures show that they are lower than what they reported currently, that uh, their grant, their tentative grant award would be lowered. Um, if they have higher expenditures, that um, that the grant allocations would be unaffected. They wouldn't be adjusted upward um, because it would affect other organizations. Oh, and then the other, sorry. yeah. Should we, um, should we vote on this or wait until we discuss NLS? I think that's up to you all. Are they similar matter? The extension of the there's a slight difference so so maybe maybe perhaps we, we talk about MLS and then yeah I think we should and we can mm -hmm. determine yeah. the other organization that requested an extension was neighborhood legal services um, they need to submit an audit and they also requested an extension date of August 31st um, this organization has provided some schedules from their draft audit um, and the expenditures that they've reported in their application match what's in the draft audit, and they anticipate that those will be the final numbers as well. Um, we are waiting, at, you know, on final documentation, but um, they have been able to show something to uh, justify the expenditures that they've reported thus far. Um, when the committee spoke about this organization, the recommendation was to approve that extension to August 31st, um, but. Um, should NLS not be able to meet that deadline, uh, the recommendation would be to um, consider granting them further extensions. Um, and this isn't exactly the resolution that was proposed by the committee, um, but staff in preparing the proposed resolution felt that um, delegating that decision to the chair of the commission would be the most expedient way of dealing with it should uh, NLS request any further extensions. Um, similar to chalk if they do get their audit in on time the recommendation would be to lower the tentative allocation if they report lower expenditures and to keep it the same even if their expenditures are higher than what they've reported and eric could you could you actually speak to kind of the difference because um there was uh, some lengthy discussion at the committee level um, to treat NLS and chalk um, slightly different. Uh, are you, is it me? Oh, yeah. Sorry. yeah. So, yeah, um, there is a difference here. You can see that we're, we're providing a little more flexibility to NLS as a practical matter. We, we do expect that audit to come in by August 31st. I mean, it might be delayed by a couple of days. Chalk, who knows? And also with NLS, we do, as uh, Erica mentioned, we do have um, at least draft audit data, which um, is somewhat reliable and it does confirm the qualified expenditures they've reported. We don't have that for chalk. We have a lengthy track record with NLS. Um, this year is an extraordinary year for them. I believe, Juan, you can confirm this. They reported that their offices were robbed or something or ransacked or whatever words they used. They, they were hacked earlier in the year. And so that's what delayed um, the, their audit. And so I believe the committee felt that um, they, they you know, met the extraordinary circumstances standard uh, more easily than chalk. Yeah, so um, uh, that is is why we're suggesting a little more flexibility for NLS than, than we are for, for Chalk. Uh, Eric, this is Rich. Uh, Chalk used to be, I think it still is, a one or two person operation handling uh, mm -hmm. conservancies for uh, children at the hospital. And like the law schools, the hospital doesn't have a separate accounting um, uh, structure for the legal services that are provided through this one person office. Uh, and their history with us isn't very long because the person who's there invented this, mm -hmm. saw a need and created it, and uh, is a, has done an extraordinary job. Uh, not being as lenient with them strikes me as uh, troubling. Uh, and I would like to, the, the staff to, to do whatever it can in terms of the carve out for law schools to think about hospitals in the same way. 
Juan, would you would you object if we made the resolutions parallel? If we gave the, gave you some some discretion on chalk as well. I'm sorry, Eric. That that was a staff recommendation. Um, was to have parity with these two. I believe it was a decided um, to want to to have. Um. Let me let me uh, jump in. When we're talking about granting uh, an additional extension beyond the 31st of August, what are we thinking about? I mean, here Eric was just saying maybe a day or two. Uh, what if it's a week? Um, and the reason why I'm asking is, what does it mean for staff and allocation for uh, going forward in terms of timing? Practically speaking, um, ideally, we would have had the numbers, the firm numbers, by the time we go to run the formula um, next week. However, we're already providing an extension to the 31st. Uh, practically speaking, um, it, it doesn't make that much more of a difference. And, and I think this is why it was communicated at, at the committee level, um, that we thought there should be some parity between the two. Um, however, I, I believe, and I don't want to speak on behalf of at least what I heard from the committee members, is that we were granting a lot of extensions that we wanted um, to kind of uh, be firm at some point. Um, the, I, I guess the, the one hard deadline I would suggest is um, by the time we go to vote for eligibility and um, and approve their budget allocations at November meeting, that it, it should not be beyond that date. But but there is a little flexibility given that we're, we're going to be providing an extension beyond the November 14th date, which is not ideal because if um, NLS or CHOC does come back with qualified expenditures that are lower, uh, we'll reduce our work, but that would mean that we wouldn't be distributing those funds um, for, for um, 2020. Uh, 2021, we'd be holding that back in reserves until the following year, because at that point, programs would have already been completing out their budget application. So the idea is that um, definitely NLS, because of their extraordinary situation, and Chalk, uh, as Rich is saying, also has an extraordinary situation, presumably because it's a it's connected to the to the hospital, and we're trying to get to these numbers. My my only concern that I have is equity with the other organizations. They all they were able to get their documentation in on time, and so as we're saying now, there's a potential that we could be lenient through the next meeting, which is the 13th of November, that's quite a runway. Um, I, don't, that, I don't think Juwan, if Juwan is given, is well, you're actually saying? you're given the discretion, so. Yeah, but is, is that what, I, I'm trying to get a framework around that discretion. So is that what you're, you're thinking, Juwan? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not. Are we saying, are we, how, I guess what, I, what I'm, I'm trying to determine here, and I don't know if any of the other commission members have the same uh, thoughts, uh, are we saying we're, we're granting an extension beyond August the 31st and potentially up to the 13th of November? No. No, that wouldn't be my I, idea. Yeah, so just for clarity, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm drilling down. I'm actually thinking flexibility to allow them a day or two, maybe a week, you know, that sort of thing, not two months. And, and, and all based upon the fact that we have high confidence that the, that the audit is well underway and that, it, and that it is going to be completed. You know, whereas Chuck um, didn't quite have that same level of confidence. Um, may I? Just to intervene and suggest that this seems like a completely reasonable request. And if we want to delegate that authority to the chair, I'm completely comfortable with it. And I would, I would uh, motion to 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 uh, approve this resolution as written. Uh, the NLS and modifying the chalk one, if that's appropriate at this time. Make sure that. Is there a second to that? Well, so is your, so Will, your, your motion is that the resolutions for both organizations should have similar language? Is that what you're saying? That would be my, yes. That would be my understanding and, and delegating to the chair. I had a comment. 
Yes. Which chair? It's um, as it's written right now, it's chair of the commission. Yeah. So I'd like to give the chair of the commission a little cover. Thank you. <laughs> and add the chair of the commission in conjunction with state bar staff. Good. That would have been my interpretation of this anyway, but thank you for the additional language. I think it would be good to add it. Yes. So Will, are you comfortable with adding that additional language? Absolutely. Absolutely, let's add it. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or any other questions? As, so Will has moved. Has it been seconded? Not yet, Bob. Would you like to do that? I'll second then, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so shall we move to roll call vote on this, Dawn? Um, and just, just to clarify, um, mm -hmm. it would be voting for um, the NLS motion as written with the, the, the slight amendment. Um, and, and, and the chalk motion would be, I, I'm sorry, can you? And the chalk motion would be a mirror image of the NLS okay. motion. Aglagi? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Bartles, uh, I'm sorry, Al Saraf? Bartleson? Bayless Spitemaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Vitelli? Yes. Hopley? Yes. DuBose? Delfino? Friedman? Friedman? Corey, are you still there? Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Myers? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Chris Schreiber? Chris, are you on mute? Zanarelli? Yes. I'm a yeah. Thank you, Chris. Zanarelli? Okay. Yes. Let me count. One out of 14 without um, Corey's vote. 14 as well. Thank you. Motion passes, Zanarelli. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so Eric and Erica, okay, I see the next resolution for mm -hmm. the rest of them. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's the big one. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, as was also mentioned in the memo that you all reviewed, uh, this is the proposed resolution to tie up the rest of the outstanding issues um, regarding eligibility. So the it, it's recommended that the commission uh, find 18 organizations eligible for a pro bono allocation and three organizations ineligible in 2021 um, as listed in attachment B to the memorandum that you received. And then the five programs that were reviewed as part of the eligibility review conference discussion, um, Community Lawyers Inc., East Bay Family Defenders, Housing Rights Center, Kids in Need of Defense, and USC Gold School of Law, um, that those five organizations be found ineligible in 2021, and that the remaining list of applicants, um, which was an attachment A to the memorandum, be found eligible by the commission for funding in 2021, uh, with the exception of chalk and NLS, that those would be pending receipt of their final audit or financial review. I, I have one net I'm in favor of the, this, but I would suggest in the third resolution changing the word prior and substituting separate. I mean, I would so move with that slight modification. That's on page eight, correct? 14 of the PowerPoint. Okay, of the, of the PowerPoint, okay. And page eight of our hard copies, all right. <clears throat> we have someone to second that? 
I, I have a question. Please. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is, if there are organizations that were abstaining around, do we um, say that with our vote or how do we handle that since we're, we're taking all of them together? Mm. Um, oh. Say it when you, uh, with your vote, and we'll note it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that hmm. question, Zahira. Any other questions or comments? And so, Eric, you moved. Do we have a second? Second. Deborah Myers, second. Thank you. Okay, shall we move to roll call? Foggy? Yes. Iskin? Yes, I'm standing on Bait Sedek and USC Gould. Al Sarab? Bartleson? A list fight master? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Michelle? Uh, yes, though I'll abstain on the uh, ineligible findings for the organizations that are found ineligible. Connolly? Yes. Du Bois? Delfino? Friedman? Corey Friedman? Mann? <laughs> Yes, abstaining on Housing Rights Center. Meeker? Yes, abstaining on Public Law Center. Myers? Yes. Plantold? Yes, abstaining on Bay Legal. Rhinus? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Chris? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yes. I have 14, Crystal. You have 14? I have 14 and four unnoted abstentions. <clears throat> Corey just returned. Um, I think she was having issues earlier, but she's back in. Corey, did you want to vote on this, um, the motion that's on, on the screen right now? We have enough um, to pass the motion. Corey? Okay, so I, I think we could just stick with the 14th or so. Um, Bonnie motion passes. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, um, Erica and Eric, how, is there another another slide coming? Or I think we're, have we I think exhausted we're good. Oh, okay. are we good, Erica? Um, just a quick overview of the next steps for this. Um, so next week, the Office of Access and Inclusion would anticipate releasing kind of allocations and budget forms after running the formula. Uh, the calendar currently has a deadline of September 21st for budget proposals to come back from the eligible organizations. And then the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee would meet on October 28th uh, to review and approve budgets. And then the commission will meet, I believe, on November 13th to finalize those awards. And I would also say this is a little different, but um, remember we previously granted significant flexibility to IELTA and IELTA grantees to carry over their um, their allocations. So and I guess that would come to the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee and ultimately to the commission as well? Yes, ultimately to the commission. Yep. And that'll be later in the year, I assume, sort of October, November-ish. It's still since for Commission meeting to approve those um, carryover and budget modification requests. Okay. Now, now I'm finished. I, I was waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was sure. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. This was. Um, you could see there was a lot happening uh, before the eligibility budget review uh, subcommittee. And um, thank you for everyone and uh, Eric for your leadership there. And Erica, you're fantastic. Thank you for everything. Um, all right, so shall we move on to partnership grant funding? I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I believe um, Christina and Dan are going to take over. Christina? Um, I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, looking good. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. 
partnership grants are a lot of fun. A little bit of background. There's a there's a piece of the money that we get to divvy out to programs that want to develop projects in partnership with the courts to help self-represented litigants in civil matters. And so the Partnership Grants Committee gets to review all different kinds of proposals and see the creativity that these different projects implement to, to make these, these fantastic programs. So I, had a, I think we all had a, had a good time this year, as always, looking at them all. And they, they all um, were very good and exciting projects. This is the general process. The applications are due by March 16th, at least they were this year, 2020. And then after we get the applications, the committee will review them, break up into little teams, takes several weeks to review them. And then we come to the commission like we are today for recommendations on funding. This year, we had 35 proposals that were submitted. Four were for new services, three for projects that uh, took a year or maybe more off, maybe tweaked their program a little bit and came back. So that's good. The total requested was 2.696 million. And we ultimately had 2.423410 million available to distribute. And the slide shows the breakdown of the money that we were able to distribute. As I said, the applications were due March 16th. As you may recall, three days after the applications were due, that's when Governor Newsom issued the stay at home order and this whole COVID situation happened. So what we did and what staff did a, a great job uh, at was surveying all of the current partnership grantees because most of these grantees are returning to discover if they anticipated having unspent funds as a result of the COVID situation. Uh, most of them did anticipate to have unspent funds um, and also most of them expected to return to on-site service. So we had to, uh, the partnership grant committee had to work on, okay, what are we going to do with the unspent funds? We did. I'm not going to get too into the weeds here, but we did uh, we did find solutions that we feel are appropriate. In um, May 22nd was our first partnership committee meeting, and during that meeting was the development of funding ranges. And at that meeting, an interesting question arose because there were a few projects that had expungement components to them, and. The Budget Act says that partnership grant funds can only be used for civil matters, cannot be used to fund criminal matters. So then there was a question, is expungement considered criminal or civil? Ultimately, it's, it's still kind of an open question, but ultimately at this point, our general counsel recommends that partnership grant money should not be used to fund uh, expungements. Or there was a similar question about helping people with infractions. Um, pending a rules revision review. So we were able to work with the programs that had expungement components or some sort of criminal component to their projects. And the, sh the long and the short of it is we were able to, they were either, either able to carve it out or come up with a different solution to ensure that partnership money was not going to be used to fund that component of their projects. Then on June... Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. There's just yeah. a, a comment from Bob. Oh. I'm wondering if it's possible to enlarge in the, uh, which one is it, Bob? You're, you're, you're saying the numbers are too small to decipher? Okay. Ms. Van Arelli referred us to the numbers, and that's in an extremely small slide, which I can't read the numbers. So, Christina, just to let you know, um, the way that we're seeing it right now, we're seeing the the, the slide that you're meaning to show it's also showing a very small version of the next slide and then oh okay hold on just a second yeah so i think that's and why you, Bob you told us to look at the numbers this is it we, we, we do have you a told nice us to look at the numbers, the numbers and that's uh, we'll be able to provide those to you in a nice larger format thank you Dan. okay how's that much better sorry about that <laughs> Thank you, and sorry to interrupt, please. No, I'm not. 
I appreciate that. All right, so um, where was I? The June 26th meeting was next, and that's where, uh, that's the one where we confirm that projects should not be used for expungement or infractions pending the rules revision review. I think that's where I left off. We had further development of funding recommendations at that meeting, and we had tentative recommendations at that meeting. And in fact, there's an attachment C to the memorandum regarding the partnership grant funds. And attachment C is a spreadsheet that shows all of the projects, the amounts they requested, and the June 26 tentative recommendation. And part of the reason why it's tentative is because at that point, we're working off of an estimate of how much money we think is gonna be available for allocation. Um, and as it turned out, we were close, but we met again on August 11th and the tentative allocation was 2.47 million. Um, and the estimated available was 2.423. So we were off 1.88%. So what we decided to do was just give everybody a haircut by one point. 1.8862% of our tentative recommendation so that we would be dispersing all of the funds generally the way we had decided tentatively. So that was just a couple days ago. And so this next slide shows the final recommendations, which is the tentative minus the 1.8862%. So it's very minor change from the tentative recommendations that are in your packet. And I'll just keep clicking through. This represents uh, 35 projects, so, uh, 24 different organizations. Yeah. Yes. Are there any questions so far? We have one question from uh, Jim regarding ex expungements. Yes. Yeah. I wasn't quite sure I followed your analysis when you're talking about expungements. Did you consider expungements civil or criminal? At this point, they're considered criminal, but Brady is still, Brady, do you want to speak on this? Sure, yeah. Um, so, essentially, it's, it's really an open question. Um, unlike the uh, legal services, uh, LSC, which um, has issued regulations which very narrowly define what is criminal um, uh, to exclude um, things like expungement and allow them to be treated as civil. Uh, we don't have any rules or regulations um, making that distinction. Um, you know, if, if the, the very best argument I would say is that they are, um, they are criminal, not civil, um, but um, that could change if uh, we go through a public comment and a you know, rules making process. Um, and it could change with new, uh, new, new, uh, new uh, uh, clarifications to the statute. Um, for that reason, um, because of the um, lack of clarity and, and the risk, um, we were able to work with those applicants to, um, to you know, basically to get them to um, um, redesign their, 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 their programs and their applications to, um, to avoid um, the, the difficult gray area. Well, based on your analysis that I read earlier today, especially your last paragraph, I think expungements ought to be considered civil, although now might not be the time to really discuss this, but I'd like to put that on the agenda for the future, because I do think expungements is an, an important issue, and I do think they ought to be considered civil. Hey, hey um, Jim, so this, this issue is actually going to be um, rolled into the codification process. Um, so it is a high priority for us to resolve, um, but, be, uh, but due to the timing of partnership grants and needing to make decisions and recommendations, we uh, just uh, have this kind of temporary or you know, Band-Aid solution um, while, while we work that issue um, out in, in the bigger process. Oh, great, that's fine with me, I'm, I'm happy to wait. Thank you. Can I, make, can I make a comment real quick on this, sort of as a preview to the codification process? Yes. I, I, I have to disagree with Jim. I, I think they're clearly criminal. They change the outcome of the sentence that was imposed. In California, an expungement isn't technically an expungement. It's actually 
a dismissal of the charges. And so yeah. I, I think it's clearly <clears throat> criminal, I, but I do think <clears throat> the cleanest vehicle for this is not a state bar rule, but rather seeking some legislative amendment to allow uh, funding for uh, these for these expungement programs. I do agree with Jim's assessment that they are very, uh, these programs are very important, especially for people who are trying to get back on their feet after having sustained a criminal conviction. So anyway, that's my, that's sort of my preview uh, advice for, for future discussion. Are there any other questions? I, I had one. On a different different issue, um, looking just at some of the organizations um, and the cuts that were recommended, which I think pretty much ended up uh, in the August recommendation. The NLS uh, Neighborhood Legal Services has a couple of programs that uh, you guys recommended fairly substantial cuts for, um, and I was curious about that, and particularly as yes, to why, just generally, I mean what your thinking was. And then there's something called the Consumer Technology Project, which kind of piqued my curiosity. Like, what, what is that? Um, I can uh, speak a little bit to the proposals that Neighborhood Legal Services uh, submitted. I was the staff uh, member for the review team that looked at those along with Chris Shriver and Justice Murray. Um, Neighborhood Legal Services uh, submitted three of the um, biggest dollar um, requests that we received uh, for projects that in two cases were described as new projects, but in fact had been in place since 2012 or previously. Mm -hmm. And both of those had um, budgetary um, components that were opaque to us and we were not able to get clarity on those. Uh, the third project, uh, Stabilizing Families, is a proposed new service for guardianship work. Um, once again, that was a project where, for example, a significant amount of funding had been allocated for uh, travel between two different courthouses where the project does not involve travel between those courthouses. So um, in, a after being unable to get better clarity as to those matters, and in view of the fact that uh, those projects, the, the two that were coming back after a long time, um, were um, not considered uh, a as high a priority for funding as the projects that were coming in for first time funding or that had only been in operation for less than five years. Um, those wound up uh, at the end of the consideration and were uh, awarded the funds that uh, did not go to the other organizations, uh, mainly because we weren't exactly sure how uh, all of the budgeting had been worked out and it looked to us like where we wound up appropriately gauged the funding to the amount of services being identified compared to what the other organizations in similar markets were receiving. Okay, that makes sense. What is the consumer technology project? Curious um, about that. So the consumer work is very labor intensive. Uh, we're talking now about people who are uh, defendants <clears throat> in consumer litigation like um, a contract or of adhesion or uh, a form contract or something else like that, even um, uh, identity theft. The d plaintiffs tend to be uh, corporations with tremendous resources to dump uh, discovery and all kinds of paperwork. So these projects often work around helping people manage that paperwork, the, the flood of, of litigation materials. The technology here is also being discussed in the Inland County Legal Services Consumer Project. Uh, the idea is to have software that will help people generate the amount of paperwork they're going to need to generate to be effective in, in defending in these matters. Uh, the concern raised by the Partnership Grant Committee was that uh, to the extent these projects are focused on work at or near the courthouse, uh, the more involves building in software to do things that essentially you can now do it at home. You can take care of your business uh, wherever you are. It's a little divergent from the idea that this is a project for someone who walks into the courthouse with a problem. So again, in terms of priority of funding, uh, 
the committee expressed um, more enthusiasm, I think, for the work that was going to happen between two individuals uh, in the middle of a litigation context versus a, um, a project that would involve developing software that would help people generally. Dan, this is this is Chris. This was the one run by the UC Irvine law professor. Am I that was the ICLS one. That was the ICLS one. Yeah. So it was sort of a request for uh, funds out of this clinic. And if memory serves, one of the concerns that I think we surfaced, and maybe it was just me in the committee meeting, was that um, it was to develop the technology as well. And um, the developer of the technology was the applicant. I think that there, there wasn't perfect clarity as to either of these projects. There was a general sense that this is critical work, that it's gonna get worse before it gets better considering where the economy is going right now. And these were both two applicants that have a great record of developing services to serve broad constituencies. Um, and for those reasons, we wanted to, to help support what they could do, um, but we didn't want to fund a technology piece that wasn't clear, clearly to, um, within the, the scope of these grants uh, based on the materials in the, in the proposals. Well, seems interesting and a little squishy, but I'm, I'll just defer to you guys. I don't need to take any more time on it. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Very All good. Right. So, thank you, uh, Christina and Dan. So, uh, are we moving now to a language for a recommendation? Yes, I it's hope up so. on the screen. Very good. Uh, well, since this is being recorded, let me let me just read it out loud. Um, should the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission concur with the Partnership Grants Committee Committee's recommendations, passage of the following resolution is recommended. Resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approves the Partnership Grants funding recommendations for 2021 Partnership Grants as approved by the Partnership Grants Committee at its August 11, 2020 meeting. Those are the numbers that are on the slides above. Very good. Thank you, Dan. I'm sorry, so, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Dan, just procedurally, would you mind emailing that um, the spreadsheet um, to the entire commission? Not at all. Okay, well, Dan is doing that. Um, so someone like to move? It's all moved. Bob Plantholt. Any comments, any questions before we take a second? Is there someone who'd like to second the motion? I'll second it, Kim Savage. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Bob. Roll call vote, Duan? Um, Aglagi? Yes. Wiskin? Yes. Asaraf? Yes. Oh, hi, Amin. Hi, sorry I'm late. <clears throat> Bartleson? Bayless Fightmaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Du Bois? Delfino? Friedman? Yes. Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Myers? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. And it, should that go out to uh, lstfc at calbar.org? I want to make sure I'm sending this to the right place. Sorry, excuse me. Um, I have 16, Crystal. I'm Crystal, do you have 16? Yes, confirming, yes. Great, um, motion passes, Bonachet. Okay, great, very good, thank you. Dan, um, I'm not sure if you've 
gotten your question answered in terms of where that goes. I just, just want to make sure I'm sending it to the right place. LSTFC at calbar.org. You know, I, I don't know the, uh, the, 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 the serve. Can you email Vicki and ask or, or, or um, Kim? Sure. Uh, right, if that wasn't Dan. it, then you'll have it momentarily. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Christina, for um, everything. Uh, uh, and thank you, Christina. Um, it, this was a, um, a year uh, with some surprises. Uh, and um, I think that uh, it worked out well because we had fantastic leadership and because I had a lot of support. So I want to uh, just make a shout out to, uh, to Crystal and, and Christine and also to Elizabeth, uh, who worked really, really hard to make sure that this all came together. Yes. Excellent work, everybody. Brilliant. Thank you all. Thank you for, for the presentation and all the hard work behind it. Uh, so shall we move to um, the 31 million National Settlement Fund? Greg and Chris, you guys ready? Let me share my screen because I have their PowerPoint. Okay, I'm happy to kick this off. And of course, it uh, goes without saying, but Chris, uh, if you want to stop or interrupt me at any time to add anything, please feel free to do so. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I, I think for the nine members of the Homelessness Prevention Committee that met two days ago now on Wednesday, much of this will be a repeat, although uh, we did make an effort to incorporate some information that came out of that meeting and the good feedback that you all provided. So let's move to the next slide if we could. Um, so ultimately, um, we'll want the full commission to obviously review the information that's being presented here today. And uh, the two resolutions towards the end will summarize that uh, we'll ask the commission to approve the, the tentative timeline that you see before you, as well as the applications for both the formula and the competitive grants. Um, so on the timeline that you see before you, I won't go through this line by line unless you would like me to do that. Uh, instead, what I'll try and do is to hit sort of the highlights and the key dates that we are envisioning between now and January 2021, which is when we've targeted for the disbursement of the $31 million in funding. So as I had mentioned earlier, we met two days ago with the HP committee. Uh, the committee during that meeting approved uh, this particular timeline as well as the formula and the competitive grant applications, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Obviously we're meeting today with the full commission to provide all of you with an update and the information, uh, the highlighted information with respect to this funding. Staff has been working with an individual who will be ultimately programming the uh, application in Smart Simple to collect both for the formula as well as the competitive grants. And we are shooting for end of August, early September to finalize those applications and then release them, uh, release those publicly through Smart Simple so that uh, programs can begin reviewing and uh, working up their applications. Uh, one of the, I think one of the comments that came out of the, the meeting two days ago uh, was the suggestion to hold some type of a webinar just to provide programs that are potentially interested in applying an opportunity to ask any questions that they might have and for staff and or the committee members to provide more clarity about what uh, they might be looking for in terms of applications. So uh, we've uh, plugged in some dates here and we think uh, September 3rd might be an appropriate time to do that. Uh, one of the things that we've also uh, done is to stagger the application deadline dates between the formula and the competitive grants. Um, because the formula grant, I think you'll see later on, it will tend to be a little bit more straightforward in terms of what we're asking the applicants to uh, provide in terms of information whereas a competitive grant will probably require uh, some more uh, due diligence on their part. So September 11th is when we're proposing that the formula applications be due. Um, and then obviously staff will go ahead and start 
the uh, review and the evaluation process. One of the other suggestions that the HP committee made was to hold a convening session to once again allow all applicants to come together in a format similar to this in a Zoom virtual meeting where we will not only allow the applicants the opportunity to ask questions and to potentially collaborate with other potential applicants, but to also present uh, some topic speakers, uh, which we're sort of in the process of fleshing out, but to provide some uh, critical information about sort of the housing situation and the homelessness situation as it stands today, so that it could provide some background and context for applicants to know perhaps if there's a particular area that they might want to steer their uh, project towards. Um, end of September, early October, uh, we will begin the process of forming the working groups comprised of both staff members as well as committee members. Uh, we are right now envisioning four separate groups, so they will each be given, similar to uh, the partnership grant model, a cohort of applications to review, and we will uh, set up additional uh, meetings for those committees to come together to talk about their respective applications and to start forming some recommendations about which projects to fund. And uh, we're looking at November, mid-November timeframe for uh, the committee to formulate some final recommendations on the projects to be funded. And we think that realistically we'll probably require another ad hoc meeting sometime in December by the commission to approve the HP committee's recommendations. And if all goes according to plan, we hope to start cutting checks in January of 2021. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so as I had mentioned previously, uh, there is currently $31 million of uh, homelessness prevention funding, uh, which was uh, came out of the National Mortgage Settlement. And for those of the commission members who were around this time last year, you'll recall that there was a $20 million EAF homelessness prevention fund, which uh, the staff and the commission administered and this particular funding, the $31 million, is largely modeled off of that $20 million, and we're seeing almost identical language in terms of the actual statute. And uh, like that original $20 million funding, uh, this $31 million is bifurcated into two tranches. The first tranche, or 75%, is once again being distributed via formula to uh, IOLTA applicants that currently provide eviction defense or tenant defense type work. And then the remaining 25% will be distributed via a competitive process through an RFP uh, minus a 5% administrative fee that's highlighted here. Um, in terms of the process to where we got here today, there's been a number of uh, separate meetings and calls uh, that was conducted with the HP committee working group members. We also had conversations with Bonnie Hoff at the Judicial Council and Selena Copeland at LAC just to solicit their feedback and input. And uh, there were a number of sort of considerations and what we call decision points. And I think uh, per the last meeting, we uh, got sufficient feedback and resolutions on those. So just to highlight, uh, the $31 million will be uh, distributed in three-year grant periods. So just to use a simple example, we, an organization that received 900,000 will get 300,000 per year. Um, assuming that they meet sort of specific requirements, which we'll need to establish with respect to reporting and that they're on progress uh, in terms of spending down the funds and that they're doing what they originally signed up to do. Uh, the minimum grant amount, like the original 20 million, uh, will be $50,000 and maximum will once again just be based on the IOLTA uh, formula allocation. Uh, the application, once again, I think Relatively speaking to the competitive grant will be very straightforward. Uh, we'll ask the organization to highlight the current uh, eviction defense, tenant defense, homelessness prevention work that they're doing. Um, and then we'll ask them to provide obviously a budget to support what it is that they're proposing to do. And then just some sort of standard boilerplate project assurances language. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the competitive grant, once again, the 25% component or roughly about 7.36 million 
We also talked about some of the specific uh, points with respect to the application. Uh, the materials that you received has a copy of both the formula and the competitive uh, applications. You'll see that the competitive one is much more involved, much more detailed. And once again, hitting on the high points, the, the three year grant period, uh, there was quite a bit of robust discussion about whether to apply a minimum grant or a grant amount or a maximum. And I think ultimately the committee decided to leave that open and we'll leave it up to the organizations to come back to us uh, to sort of detail out what they think is an appropriate budget to be able to accomplish the project that they're proposing to do. Also, the committee agreed to allow subgranting to IELTA and non-IELTA organizations. And I think the idea behind here, behind this was to, to the extent that this might encourage uh, programs to reach out and work with uh, other organizations to come up with innovative, creative projects. That's something that the committee wanted to encourage. And then uh, similar to the formula application, uh, you know, there will be a number of questions, uh, budgets, and then I think the component that's unique uh, relative to the formula is that we'll also be employing the use of a scoring rubric, which we also did with the original $20 million uh, HP grant as well. Uh, next slide, please. A couple of uh, additional issues um, that uh, we've already started to work into the RFP application from the meeting two days ago. Um, there was a suggestion to sort of further clarify and define uh, the term rural. And uh, based on the conversation, I know this is not new, but uh, we will be adding additional information with respect to the medical service study area. Uh, and I know this is information that's been provided in other grants, and we wanted to make sure that that gets in incorporated just so that there's no sort of ambiguity about uh, what the committee is looking for in terms of rural. The other definition, uh, the other development rather that emerged recently was that in the original $20 million of funding, uh, staff had interpreted that because the organizations that were getting funded were IOLTA organizations, that just as a matter of course, they would be screening for 125% of uh, FPL. And based on Brady's recent review, and I think also confirmed by Donna, uh, their read of the language is that uh, it, it is not restrictive to that 125%. So we wanted to provide further clarity uh, to not only the existing uh, EAF HP grantees, but obviously make clear for the future applicants that there isn't that specific requirement. Um, having said that, um, if there are programs that wish to serve clients beyond that 125% guideline, I think the, the idea now is that the applicants would need to specify that and then ultimately the commission, well, the HP committee and then the commission would have full discretion to review and or approve that request. And then uh, I think Brady brought up a good point that we think that perhaps this issue will sort of resolve itself uh, from the standpoint that obviously the organizations that are uh, serving clients outside of that 125% of FPL, they wouldn't be able to classify those uh, under the qualified expenditures. So that's something that we wanted to highlight and make sure that that would be added to uh, the existing application. Dewan, do, do you want to add anything on that? I think you're muted. Sorry, just to add the, the 125 um, for, for the formula piece, um, the, the programs will be allowed to serve, um, uh, you know, clients over above, above 125. For the, um, the RFP though, um, they'll need to answer a question of, are they serving above 125 to provide a, 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 an explanation, which then the committee will make a determination to, to fund or not. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I had alluded to earlier the use of a scoring rubric to evaluate the competitive grant proposals. And uh, this has been um, edited numerous times, which is completely fine. And in fact, as uh, recent as late this morning, I was fielding some emails from uh, several of the committee members and the feedback has been terrific. So this is the latest version that um, we'll continue to refine, but hopefully we're getting closer and closer. Uh, ultimately, we're looking at a number of criteria sets and assigning uh, a set number of points. And during the review process of the applications, 
what staff hopes to do is to provide very specific um, instruction slash guidance that which will obviously come up with in conjunction with the committee to guide the various evaluation groups to ensure that the evaluation process is as consistent across all of the evaluation groups. And uh, we imagine that there's going to require uh, a number of sort of different meetings and what we'll call calibration sessions just to ensure that um, one group is scoring their application similarly to another group just so that there's not inconsistency in the, in the process. So I think there's still a little bit more work to be done here, um, but this particular slide that you see in front of you shows the latest in terms of uh, what the committee is thinking about total points possible for each specific criteria. And my sense is that we'll need to continue fleshing this out a little bit before it's uh, sort of finalized, but uh, we will continue to do that and work with the committee and the working group. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, these are the two resolutions that we would ask um, the commission to make a motion. The first is to approve the timeline that you had seen earlier uh, in terms of the administration process for uh, the $31 million in funding. And then also secondly, to approve both the formula and the RFP applications. And we put in concept here because we do realize that there may still need to be some additional tweaks, but I think largely the idea and sort of the structure is there and there may require some additional in terms of tweaking of the language, um, but that's what we would ask. Are there any questions or any comments up to this point? Okay, I got a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. I got a question on the further resolve on the uh, the formula. Uh, are we still talking about? I I didn't realize on this latest version that you had two categories accounting for seventy percent of the um, scoring rubric. Is is that going to be fixed now? Because I would still argue that seventy percent in just two categories is way too much. That that you got to really break that down into more refined categories? Um, I am definitely willing to work with the working group and the committee members to, to come to a compromise, for lack of a better term. I think there's some different views and different schools of thoughts on that. So by no means is this 40 and 30 finalized. Uh, I think this the scoring rubric for sure will need to uh, continue to be tweaked. Okay. So Greg, can we go back to the um, original resolution? There's another question. Corey, uh, and, and then I heard someone else right before Jim uh, spoke. Will, okay. Corey, please, and then Will. Uh, I'll be very quick, but just responding to um, Jim's question. Uh, this was what was discussed in the subcommittee meeting. I think part of the idea was um, to uh, give the guidance there by um, including a bunch of examples within those categories, but to have larger categories in part because it allows um, the commission a, a reasonable amount of discretion so that if there's something really spectacular or likewise anything really concerning within the general category of say um, the quality of the program or the um, organizational capacity that the that can be given due weight and this was based on the previous experience with these grants and a um, and doing a numerical score because the last round of the homelessness prevention grants was the first time that the commission had used numerical scoring I believe um, and uh, speaking from my own experience with that I think having it broken out to a lot of categories in the previous version was difficult because it meant that if there was something really, really worrisome that fell into a category such as a program's history, for instance, uh, there was really, only, you were still limited exclusively to the five or 10 points and you, you couldn't really um, reflect the, the weight of that particular issue. So that's just my summary. 
Thank you, Craig. Will, you have a question or a comment? <clears throat> uh, it's, it's more of a comment. Um, so I have some strong feelings on this matter and was up late contemplating them. Uh, I've had to deal with housing issues and had to seek legal assistance in the state of California and it was uh, a nightmare that I, I cannot express uh, during this meeting. So it's a very personal matter to me. And I think that because of the importance of housing in general to everyone in, individual, to their well-being, for all of the factors that this commission and staff I know are very well aware of, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, I do believe that um, this timeline and these projects and proposals should be subject to a higher level of scrutiny. And what I mean by that is that I, I believe that there should be the maximum flexibility for the interpretation of the statutes and rules to benefit the LSP. Um, and I am not convinced that the, the way that the timeline has been implemented here, and my understanding is the rules come from the precedent that was set last year. And that makes a lot of sense, although I, I wasn't around, so I can't speak to them. Um, and that the timeline here doesn't necessarily reflect what I see as a, a public emergency, especially as we know the eviction moratorium or the filing moratorium in the courts is going to expire on September 1st. And then in the largest counties, the moratoriums expire on the September 30th, I believe, Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Diego. And given those realities and the number of eviction filings that we can expect, I'm, I think the, the two pots of money that the legislature established should be treated differently. And at least the formula money can be distributed sooner. Um, I don't know about the reality of that because of the roadblocks and staff may have a lot to say about that, but if we don't investigate and fully understand what those roadblocks are, then I, I, I feel like we aren't meeting uh, the moment, as a governor I know is fond of saying, to, to make sure that we help out the people who need the help and get the money going flowing for what we expect to be a, as the news has described it, tsunami of evictions. And I, I'm going to leave it right there because I, I imagine there are some responses, but it's really important to me and I don't think I can support this timeline as written given those considerations. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you for that. Greg, Duan, Chris, uh, anyone want to comment to that? I see that uh, Kim Savage just said she has a comment. If, if, if uh, none of the, the staff in the chair of the subcommittee have anything to say, uh, go right ahead, Kim. Well, uh, this is Donna. Oh, Donna, please. Sorry, I'm, my video had been off so I could eat lunch without you all seeing. Uh, <laughs> So the um, at this point, I think I think last year was different, um, and the expectation was clearly given to us last year with the twenty million that it be that we get it out the door as quickly as possible, and we'd had numerous conversations with legislative staff about that. Um, this year, the thirty one million dollars is. It, it is, I, they knew what they were, what the result was by rolling it clearly into the, um, the EAF um, uh, grant, um, which has a 2020, which has a, cal a calendar year cycle. Um, so I, I, I don't actually think that there's an expectation on the part of the legislature that we roll this 31, $1 million out more quickly. And staff really had to go through quite a number of, um, uh, qu quite a, a significant amount of, of effort last year in order to get the money out as quickly as we did. Um, with everything else that's going on right now, with all of the work that you were just talking about with the 100 programs and eligibility, um, I just don't think it's realistic that we'll be able to get that money out 
um, uh, uh, it makes more sense uh, to me that we do it as part of the normal um, uh, 2021 calendar cycle. Can I, can I also add to that? Um, so, um, you know, the, the legislation was signed in June and the day after um, we emailed the commission and staff began working, this is already a very expedited timeline for us. Um, we immediately reached out to um, Legal Aid Association of California and Bonnie to begin planning. We, we yet don't even have a contract with Bonnie because this is happening so quickly that we were able to put together the RFP, um, hire an independent contractor to build out Smart Simple to get the, the funding to use. So this really is happening at lightning speed for us. Um, But, but I, I, I do appreciate your comments, Bill. It's just, it's, it's very quickly. Thank you, Duan and Donna. Uh, Kim and then Selena, in that order, please. So William, I, I think that everyone has the same view of the tsunami that's coming and the essentialness of housing stability for people's well-being. Um, this timeline, I mean, Dwan pretty much said what I was going to say. This timeline, oh, adorable. <laughs> this timeline is so tight. But uh, what I think I can say is that the proposals will not be given short shrift in looking at them. We kind of anticipate who the, who's going to apply. Uh, for those of us who've been on the commission for get, getting very long time. Um, you know, we know those programs that have a track record. We are going to look at what they're proposing, how innovative it is, how long lasting it is. Um, but this timeline is super tight and it's going to be really tight for those of us who are reading all the applications. I, I just, I don't see how we can speed it up. Uh, you know, we also have an important accountability factor. We want to make sure that we can, if necessary, report back to the legislature on what great work was done with this and then go back and stand in line for more money. So I appreciate your comments. I think the reality, sadly, cannot immediately address all those evictions that are coming forward. Thank you, Kim. Selena, and then Will has a clarifying question. Uh, Will can go ahead of me since it's clarification. Uh, I, I just wanted to clarify that the, uh, the time fund for the competitive grant seems completely reasonable. That's a much more involved process. I was speaking specifically to the pot of uh, the 75% the of 22 million and that it, it seems as, the, as it's written, it doesn't need to be overly complicated because the legislation relies on the eligibility that's already been determined for 2020 IOLTA. And that's, that's more what I was speaking to in terms of the timeline. I just wanted to clarify that. But thank you, Kim, for your remarks. Thank you. Selena? Um, mine is just a quick comment in support of staff recommendations to have it. The, these grants start in January. I think um, what is especially helpful here to know is that with the IOLTA grants decreasing in January, um, and with the other HP funds kind of running out in June, this allows a little bit of overlap with the HP funds, but no overlap with the IELTA grant reduction. And so I think this is, um, hopefully will give staff enough time to process this, but also will allow organizations who do a lot of homelessness prevention work already dollars and would have to cut back. Hopefully they won't be able, to, hopefully they will not be forced to cut back. They'll be able to continue those core services with these dollars, as long as it's meets the other parameters of the, the grants. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Selena, for that addition. Can I can I also address that a little bit? That, sure, yes, please, Mom. Sorry. Yes. Um, that I'll also say from some of the grantees that I work with on the Shriver project, it um, because of the uh, moratorium, they've had a more difficult time spending their housing money this year. Um, they're anticipating being fully able to, um, you know, within a couple of months. But um, I think that's the other thing that that, that there is the, the 20 million that people are still spending. So this, I, as I think from, as Selena pointed out, this allows them not to have to decrease services, um, but it allows us to fully spend out the funds, um, which I think is also really important. 
I, I, yeah, I just to respond briefly, I, I appreciate both those remarks. And I guess I'm still left wondering how we can do more to be responsive, addressing those concerns uh, about funding that would be totally normal and uh, expected. Sorry, Ella. Uh, sorry, everybody. Hold on. Uh, totally normal and expected uh, during a regular year, but during a public emergency, I feel like additional effort should be taken and we really uh, should spend the, the extra time saying, coordinating with the agencies and saying, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do more? Uh, and being creative in our interventions. And so I am going to, I, I, I get the sense that there, <laughs> there's not as much concern. So I will continue to work with the, the, the staff to fully understand and um, appreciate why it has to be this way. But I really wanted to note for the record that uh, I feel like this is giving a short shrift to the, the people who most need help um, that, that we are capable of helping. Ella, thanks. Sorry. Ella also agrees with me. That's her concurrence. Thank you. Well, I think I think many of us agree with you, not just Ella, um, that this is a this is a uh, extraordinary times. I too am on the that subcommittee, and I um, I can say that there's real deep, robust conversations, and none of this is being taken lightly, as you can imagine. Um, and every thought has gone into that timeline so that um, we can meet, right? We can meet the needs of Californians at this time. And um, I have to say that I'm, I'm proud of the staff and the subcommittee and the work that we've been able to do with the legislature and Bonnie and Selena and the list goes on to be able to have access to additional funds for this very moment that, that we're speaking about. Um, and we're poised, we're positioned, this is the right office, the right location to review those, um, those applications and innovative ac applications to be able to support. And as Kim highlighted, uh, to be able to do the work well again so that we can have a third tranche of, of funds to come to continue to do the, the work that's needed. But really um, what, you're, what you're bringing up is something that we're we're all facing, and it's a dilemma that we all are are trying to balance. So, um, Corey you. has a definitely, definitely. Um, Corey has a comment, please, Corey. Yeah, just on Will's point about um, trying to figure out how best we can respond and thinking creatively, just so people know some of um, some of the things that might be available in the future. Uh, because our grantees respond, um, track benefits that they've achieved through the money, we are very hopeful that with these grants, we will be able to um, get good data about how many people have gotten to keep their homes be directly because of the work that our grantees have done and to package that to the legislature to make an argument for further funding. Um, and I, I hope that, I hope that gives us some leverage to extract some more dollars for this purpose. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Um, if, are there any other comments, questions on this, uh, on this matter and specifically the resolution that's before us, uh, the recommendation by staff? Okay, hearing none, uh, do I have a motion? Someone like to make a motion? I'll move, it's Corey. Thank you, Corey. And anyone second? It's Chris. I'll... Thank you, Chris. Dwan, shall we? Yeah. Um, Aglagi? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Al Saraf? Yes. Bartleson? Davis, Fightmaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Rochelle? Abstain. Connolly? Yes. Du Bois? Delfino? 
achievement? Yes. Dan? Yes. Meager? Yes. Myers? Yes. Feintold? Yes. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. I have 16, Crystal. 15, um, because of all substantion. One five. Oh, let me take one more time. Fifteen. You're right. Sorry. But motion passes, Bonisha. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Um, I see here that uh, Greg. Do we have more uh, as to your presentation with Chris? I think there's just one slide. This will take me a second, just in terms of summarizing next steps. Um, so, as I had mentioned, uh, we will now work with uh, the individual that we had identified earlier to build out the applications in Smart Simple. We actually had a conference call with her earlier in the week. Um, and then we will, we've also on the second bullet point have started to talk about the logistics uh, regarding the virtual convening session. Uh, that's, I think, going to require a, a bit of coordination, but uh, we, we have started that process. Um, and then a little bit later down the road, we will start reaching out to form the proposal evaluation teams. Uh, but that'll probably be more in the October-ish timeframe. And that's it for me. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris, and thank you, the subcommittee, not because I'm on it, but honestly, I was there and it's, uh, it, it, was, it was quite a discussion. And Greg, thank you so much for your leadership on this. Uh, yes. And thanks to Christine, who is also- And Christine, here. yes, all of the staff. I mean, this is, this is a, definitely a team effort. Uh, shall we move on to uh, bank grants? Sorry, Chris. Chris Driver has his hand raised. Oh, sorry. Yes, Chris. Um, the the subcommittee or the committee heard heard this. This was a big part of our conversation, but I just wanted to invite the rest of the commissioners. The convening is going to be on the fifteenth, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, sometime in mid September, and you know it's not just a convening of of current grantees or um, uh, commission members, but we'd like to sort of broaden the convening so that we are eliciting as many ambitious and creative ideas as possible. So if commissioners have their own ideas about where we can use this $7.3 million, and that includes partnership between and among untraditional partners across geography, um, in urban and rural areas, et cetera, please start thinking about those creative ideas now. And then also please, you know, reach out to your own networks to see if you can get people to come to this sort of brainstorming session that we hope to have uh, in the middle of next month. So we're, we're trying to be ambitious with this so that this money is spent on new and creative, innovative projects. And that's really what I'm, hoping that uh, that we can do as a community to, uh, you know, to, to spend this money wisely. Thank you, Chris. Impact is what we're looking for. Um, okay, shall we move on for uh, bank grants? And um, we'll hand it over to Christine. Christine, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would like to in invite Kim to um, uh, uh, speak up if, um, if I'm missing anything and, and the rest of the committee members as well. Um, and this is in regards to our last bank grant committee meeting on uh, July 20th. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so bank grant recipients uh, report project expenses in accordance with their approved yearly budgets, and they may request budget modifications as the, the need arises. And in the final year of the award, 
grantees are expected to spend down the remaining amount of the grant. So for the 2018 bank grants, uh, December 31st of this year will be the end of their three year grant period. Um, so like the need for budget revisions, grantees may encounter unexpected issues that result in challenges spending down the, the grant award. Um, and in that case, they might request a carryover of the unspent funds into the next year. So like I said, the bank grant committee met on July 20th and we reviewed three budget revisions uh, for 2019 and a um, program's request to replace a partnering organization uh, with a new organization for its 2020 bank grant. Um, and the committee approved these requests. The committee also approved staff's recommendation uh, similar to the IOLTA recommendation to be flexible with carryover and budget requests considering the COVID-19 pandemic and significant impacts on grantees' ability to conduct certain projects, um, project activities due to the state and local shelter-in-place orders. So I'll walk through these issues in a little bit more detail um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so just a reminder, and I know um, in the past couple of months, we've talked a lot about budget revisions and carryover requests. Um, so the main governing authorities for budget revision requests and carryover are the grant agreement, the general grant provisions, and the functional matrix approved by the board, um, board of trustees, um, providing the commission authority to approve requests over 25%. And grantees must use their grants in accordance with their approved budgets and then any material deviation, uh, meaning a budget change of 10% of the grant requires approval by the state bar, or as I just mentioned, the, the commission. And that they may, uh, grantees can revise their budget throughout the grant period and they would do this for a variety of reasons, unexpected costs, shifts in client need, um, or changes in staffing. So for the 2018 through 2020 bank grants, the approved budget consists of yearly grant budgets and then a total project budget uh, for the three year grant period, which identifies how funds will be allocated by the line item for the, the project. And the line items include personnel costs, non-personnel costs and subgrants. Grantees report project expenses um, in accordance with their approved yearly budget as part of their annual bank grant evaluation. Um, at the, with this report, they're also reporting on their status of the project, including successes, challenges, and lessons learned. Um, and fiscal and program staff review the evaluation to determine compliance with the grant agreement and the other governing authorities and if the project is on schedule to meet its stated goals and objectives. So for the year that we're talking about, 2019, um, these recipients submitted their evaluation on March 6, 2020. And staff reviewed the submitted evaluations and identified seven grantees that had material deviations and needed to submit a project budget. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. So four of these grantees had deviations that were uh, under 25%. So staff reviewed the um, budget revision requests for affordable housing advocates, Central California Legal Services, Family Violence Law Center, and Greater Bakersfield uh, Legal Assistance. Um, as I mentioned, reviewing not only the, the request um, and the deviation in the budget, but comparing that to what they reported in their evaluation to determine uh, whether we would approve the budget revision. And ultimately, staff approved all four budget revisions. Uh, next. And so on July 20th, the committee met to review the budget revision request for California Rural Legal Assistance legal assistance for seniors and impact fund. Uh, the committee discussed these requests in, in depth um, and staff's recommendation. And despite 
not spending down the entire budgeted amount for the two for year two of the grant all three grantees reported that they were on schedule to meet project goals and staff went through a memo which discussed the line items that accounted for the variance for each grantee and in addition staff presented the progress the grantees accomplished during year two and noted if the grantee was proposing to add unspent funds to different line items in their budget request. Um, so it was staff's recommendation to approve all three budget revisions, uh, also noting that this, um, allowing all three grantees the opportunity to spend down the unspent funds in grant year 2020, and then any un remaining unspent funds at the end of the grant period uh, would be returned to the state bar unless a carryover is requested and approved. Um, so I was going to go into the carryover and budget revision recommendation, um, but we could also, uh, the committee's recommendation to the commission is to also approve the three uh, budget revisions for those three organizations. Uh, we can, I can continue with the carryover um, unless we wanted to vote now. Well, unless there's discussion, there's there's questions. Yes, to, uh, to just continue on and just vote together. Okay. Okay, if you want to move to the but Since oh, we sorry. paused here for a moment, shall we just see if it, uh, folks have any questions or comments up to this point? Okay. All right, Christine, thank you. Please proceed. Okay, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so as indicate, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, grantees need to use their grant funds um, as approved in the, in the budget and they would submit budget revisions and return any funds afterwards. Um, next, oh, you're already there. Okay, sorry. Uh, so um, very similar to what was passed both for the IOLTA grants and the partnership grants we discussed uh, with the committee, allowing flexibility to the bank grant recipients to request um, higher carryover amounts and uh, possibly higher budget revisions uh, for the same reasons, um, given the, the pandemic and the inability, uh, the, the possible inability to spend down the remaining funds, particularly since this is the last year of the grant, they would need to request a carryover. Um, so the recommendation was uh, very similar to the IOLTA in that uh, just to let the recipients know that the committee's intention is to uh, be flexible with both carryover and budget revision requests. And that takes us to the recommendations. Very good. Thank you so much, Christine. Kim, is there anything that you have to add to this? or if there's any no, questions or any comments. Christine did a great review um, in a lot of detail. I think our overall approach is, you know, the similar theme that we've got throughout the commission, which is this, it's time, is the time to be very flexible. And so even if programs had a substantial amount of funds remaining, we had confidence in their ability to use those funds. That's it. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Kim. Okay, so um, the recommendation is before us. Is there someone that would like to make the motion? So moved. Thank you, Bob. And a second? Okay. Is that Rich? Yep. Okay, thank you, Rich. All right, Duan, shall we? Sorry, is there is there no. something, Christine? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Aglagi? Yes. Iskin? Eric, are you still on? 
Asaraf? Yes. Bartleson? Bayless Fightmaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Rochelle? Yes. Yes. Du Bois, Delfino, Friedman? Yes. Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Myers? Yes. Plantold? Yes. Rhinus? Rich? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Abstain. Vanarelli? Yes. I have 14, Crystal. 14 as well. Motion passes, Bonaché. Okay, very good. Thank you, everyone. Christine, I think you're still on. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you still have another slide, Christine? Yes. It should be for one justice. Oh. Thank you. Um, so in the meeting materials, uh, you should have also received a letter from one justice about their request. Um, and just to note that this is a 2020 bank grant. Um, uh, they received a 2020 bank grant and the goal of their project is to create a sustainable pro bono clinic model for transactional legal assistance to small businesses um, in the region by strengthening the capacity of the, the partnering uh, organizations. So One Justice um, had originally been awarded, um, I'm sorry, they had been awarded $800,000 for their 2020 bank grant. Um, and for the 2020 bank grant, uh, a big emphasis um, in determining which uh, recipients to award grants to was based on their partnerships and the partnering organizations for this project were Betzedek Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino, Inland Empire, Latino Lawyers Association, and Catholic, Chari Ch Catholic Charities of San Bernardino and Riverside Counties. Um, and then back in March, uh, once the pandemic started and the shelter in place orders, were set in place, Ayala reached out to One Justice to let them know that they were having operational hardships and they did not feel like they were going to be able to continue on with the project um, as a partnering organization. Prior to uh, submitting the application, One Justice had also been in contact, not as uh, with Inland County's legal services, not as um, a formal partner for this project, but because they are also in the region, um, have a strong presence. And so they were in communication and wanted to involve them in the project. But once ILO dropped out, um, they reached back out to ICLS to see if they were interested in becoming a formal partner uh, for the project. And that was uh, their proposal uh, to us to replace Ayala um, with ICLS and that none of the project um, goals and objectives would change. It, it really is just changing the partnering organization. They would receive the same amount. Uh, they would be doing the same work. Um, one thing to note is, uh, you know, this happened back in March. Uh, we weren't going to have a meeting until the summer and uh, ICLS got on board with the project and has been working with One Justice without knowing for sure if they were going to receive a subgrant from them. Um, and One Justice has said that they've been making a lot of progress. Um, so that's just one thing to note, the, the lag in time and also just the commitment of the organization not knowing if they were going to, to receive funds to actually do this work. Um, so One Justice is just proposing to make this uh, formal um, that ICLS is a subgrant 
And when we discussed this at the committee, the committee approved the staff recommendation to approve ICLS as a formal partner. And that is uh, the recommendation to the commission. Are there any? Any questions or comments? This is Bob. Um, I heard mention of several of the groups. Uh, are the other groups that were part of the original proposal still on board with this? That's a good question. Um, and, and I did uh, mention, um, I, I skipped over uh, one important step that did happen. So as, um, as the commission is well aware, LASSB has also had some operational difficulties and That's back, where I was going with this, yeah. Yes, um, and back uh, earlier, I believe this happened um, back in, in January, and this is what we discussed at our bank grant committee meeting in, in March, uh, we reached out to One Justice um, and another organization that had LASSB as a uh, sub grantee uh, to give them the opportunity to revise their budget um, just based on the the changing situation with LASSB and one justice had decided to revise their budget so LASSB is not a uh, current sub grant for this project um, one justice is working with LASSB in a different capacity to help them with their organizational hardships um, but they, they're not involved with the project right now. So the current uh, sub-grantees are Bedzetic and um, Catholic Charities, and, and if approved, um, ICL, ICLS. Thank you. That's what I was worried about. Okay, good. Uh, Pamela Bennett has a question. Um, my question was just that how are they different from um, the Small Business Administration itself and they're geared or, or uh, organized to help small businesses. So what are they doing differently from the actual Small Business Administration? I, I can answer that, um, Pamela. Uh, so One Justice is going in and providing lots of structural um, and governance assistance. Um, so, so it is um, fairly different. So are they prepping them for the small business administration itself or? What do you mean by prepping them for the small business? Okay. Um, let's see here. So my question was, how are they different from the actual small business administration? So is it just, just the, the, just the, their application process? to go to them for assistance, for funding, or oh, different? I, I, I think I'm, um, let me take a stab. I think I'm understanding what you're asking. So One Justice is working with these organizations to help build their pro bono capacity to ha to start clinics. Um, so it's, it's not, um, okay, so they would be holding small business uh, clinics for these, help these organizations establish small business clinics um, and help them build a pro bono pool base in this area, which um, currently I think is, is a hardship for them. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. Christine, I just wanna, uh, I'm, you, you may have said it and I just didn't uh, hear it when you did. When we were talking about San Bernardino and Bob asked the question, um, did you did you state that San Bernardino is not part of the mix now? Is that right? The, the Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino? Correct. They are not part of the 2020 bank grant. So then the 135,000 that um, is being proposed to go to ICLS, it does that incorporate the funds that would have gone to uh, Legal Aid Society of San Bernardino? How, no, how is it now being distributed, that 800,000? So the um, the 135,000 that would have gone to San Bernardino, uh, they did a budget revision um, previously back in March, and what they 
proposed in their budget revision was actually more staff time so they could work on building up um, uh, virtual uh, tools and um, work on virtual clinics. Uh, this was part of their, uh, their application pre-COVID, but then it also, uh, you know, became more important. So what they did was um, they weren't proposing another organization to take um, LASSB's place at that time. Um, they did a, a different budget revision, which included more One Justice staff time. So, so One Justice absorbed uh, San Bernardino's funding, potential funding? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kim Savage has a comment. Um, I just think that this slide should reflect in whatever way you want to, <laughs> um, the way staff wants to, that um, LASSB is not a part of this. Um, you know, that they've been removed or just, I just think this should accurately reflect that they're no longer involved um, in the One Justice uh, Partnership proposal. So we can reflect uh, a few notes to Kim. Um, and, and now it says original, so yeah, we probably should have clarified that. Um, yeah. Well, it's only because we're keeping these forever as a record. That's why. I mean, we all know, but Okay, that's it. I, I agree with Kim. I think that's where the, uh, my follow-up question is coming to. There's uh, now a bit of confusion. So we're, we're looking at, as you said, Christine Betzedek, Inland Empire is, is gone, San Bernardino is, is gone, and Catholic Charities of San Bernardino and Riverside Counties remain. And we're looking at um, adding potentially Inland Counties legal services. Is that right? These will be the three. Okay, great. <coughs> Is there another slide? Yes. So this is the staff's recommendation. Well, this is the committee's recommendation. The committee, sorry, the committee's recommendation. But this doesn't state that um Legal services uh, for San Bernardino is out. Because that was previously approved. So we're sorry for the confusion. Okay. That San Bernardino was previously approved earlier in the year. Okay. So uh, if there aren't any comments or questions on this, uh, this recommendation, do I have a motion? Deborah. Deborah? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would like to second, please. I'll second. Thank you, Kim. Duan? Um, Aglagi? Yes. Iskin? Yes. Al Saraf? Yes. Bartleson? Bayless Fightmaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Du Bois? Delfino? Friedman? Corey, are you still there? Mann? Yes. <coughs> Was that a yes? I'm sorry, excuse me. Yes, it was a yes. Thank you. Meeker? Yes. Myers? Yes. Michael? Yes. Reynolds? Yes. Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. I have 15, Crystal? Yes, I have 15 as well. Motion passes, Bonnachet. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, so thank you really, uh, before we move on to staff updates, to everyone, commission, staff, everyone, 
uh, that that was uh, quite a load um, and done very well. Thank you so very much for everyone's commitment. Staff updates, uh, monitoring visits, Duan, 2020 monitoring visits. Um, I just wanted to quickly update that we provided a list of your, your meeting materials of the monitoring visits that have been scheduled thus far. Um, we welcome um, any commission members um, uh, who's interested in attending, um, please um, contact me. Uh, we still have a number that we are working towards scheduling for the remainder of the year. If there are any that haven't been scheduled that you'd like to attend, um, we can definitely um, work with you um, to, to work around your availability. Um, we're having a hard time completing all of them. We do think the vast majority of them will be completed um, by the end of the year, um, but we're, we're running into some um, difficulties. So we have asked um, Bonnie at the Judicial Council whether um, it would be possible to extend that into um, 2021, and she has graciously agreed. Um, however, we, we will still be working towards completing the majority of them this year, and we'll provide you with an update. Great. Uh, will is letting you know, Duan, you could count on him. Oh, great. Monitoring visits. Uh, does that conclude your section? Yes, it does. Okay. All right, Christine, uh, 2020 bank grants. Sorry, that was that was both of those items. <coughs> okay. Um, shall we move on then to HP and uh, Greg? Sure. This is Greg. Um, I can give a very quick update. Um, and now I'm talking about the original $20 million of uh, EAF HP funding. Uh, two items that were discussed in the HP committee meeting two days ago was that uh, right after the shelter in place orders went into effect in the early part of this year, staff uh, received a few inquiries, questions from some of the original HP grantees asking whether there might be a possible extension of the grant termination date, which is currently June 30 of 2021. So uh, Dawn primarily had reached out to the legislative contact, had a few uh, conversations, uh, as well as with Bonnie Huff, and then an individual at the Department of Finance. And Dawn will correct me if I get any of this wrong, but um, the feedback that she received was that number one, um, any sort of requests for uh, carryovers or extension of the funding would have to occur in the year of the grant termination date. So given that we're now in August, it's still a little premature to make that request. Um, so that's uh, feedback number one. And then feedback number two, I think the general sort of consensus of what we heard was that in the current sort of limited funding environment, any funding that's not spent uh, is probably, will probably be redistributed to other areas that's needed. Um, and then I think just sort of optically, the committee talked about the fact that um, in this current environment, um, it probably wouldn't be best to sort of project that funds won't be able to spend down existing funding and then at a later date request additional funding. Um, Dewan, did I miss anything? Yeah, so, so we didn't make a request um, because um, our, our grantees, you know, providing them with some flexibility would be helpful. Um, but, but, you know, we've been assured by other grantees that, you know, once the moratorium is lifted, um, unfortunately, there's going to be surge in need. And so they, they, they will have no problem spending it down. We just wanted kind of that, that, that you know, the flexibility so they could properly plan. Um, but even without it, um, we do anticipate that they will just be able to spend, spend it down. Um, but the, the committee did decide, um, like Greg mentioned, um, in, instead of um, reviewing um, second quarter second uh, quarter expenditures to see if they're on track to spend down, giving them an, another quarter um, to see the, the progress before um, we make any decisions on reallocation of funds. That would be the update. Great, thank you. Thank you, Greg. All right, uh, should we move to liaison reports? And um, Elizabeth, uh, with COAF, please. Hey everyone, um, so I'm just giving a quick little update about um, COAF, the Council on Access and Fairness. As Bonifshay mentioned at the top of the meeting, um, uh, COAF has invited uh, Bonifshay and, and others, uh, representatives from the commission to join uh, their meeting at the end of the month um, to talk about ways um, that the two uh, sub entities might be able to partner with one another. Um, so as you all may know, um, about three years ago, diversity and inclusion was formally put into the state bar mission by a board of trustees. Um, and since then, there's been a really strategic and concerted effort 
to weave diversity and inclusion into various aspects of the bar. And so I'm sure that you've heard, um, we've studied the bar exam and question development and grading analysis. We're looking at the attorney discipline system um, and whether there's disparate impact in, in that. Um, and then we're trying to you know, address it so that we are you know, uh, moving forward with a, with a really fair uh, legal profession. As far as the work of um, the Council on Access and Fairness, um, they've been working on a lot of different initiatives that are very exciting and a lot of uh, staff that work on the uh, grant T administration is also working on those projects. Um, so there's outreach efforts to um, high schoolers and community college and college age students that we're working on right now. Uh, those activities we really are uh, trying to coordinate with um, the California Lawyers Association as well as uh, California Law. Uh, we're also looking at law school retention uh, because we are, there is uh, data that shows that students of color enter law school uh, but are not matriculating as, um, at the same rates as their white counterparts. Um, we're also we're working on um, modifying the MCLE requirements to include implicit bias. Some of you may have seen uh, the public comment on that. Um, which ended, I believe, in June. Um, and then uh, there's also been work with uh, the Judicial Council on their Judicial Diversity Toolkit. I think what probably is of most interest to the Trust Fund Commission is the recently published first annual diversity report card. Um, so as hopefully many of you know, uh, when you've, in the last two, I believe, two or three um, uh, uh, licensing fee cycles, uh, if you logged into my State Bar profile, you were directed immediately to um, a set of questions. We were asking um, demographic uh, questions, race, ethnicity, gender, um, diverse, uh, and other diversity categories. Um, and we were also trying to get at some inclusion um, information from, from attorneys. Uh, so we asked questions related to retention and career advancement, advancement as well as compensation. Um, so I, I encourage you all to um, take a look at the diversity report card. I believe an email was sent to you about that. Um, and uh, I, uh, what we are looking forward to later this year is we are working with Selena and Lack to host a diversity summit so that we can really drill down and look at um, how uh, retention and career advancement and compensation play into um, uh, the nonprofit sector. I think coupled with Lack's recent recruitment and retention report, it will really be, I think, a rich, rich uh, conversation. Um, so that's a, just a really quick report. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you, Elizabeth. If, if you haven't had a chance to read it, um, this is to commission members, please um, get access to it and do read it. it the, the, the work is by the staff is, is, is incredible. The data that's been collected is, um, is insightful and eye-opening and it does definitely cross into the work that we're doing and the justice gap study. So um, thank you, Elizabeth, for that. And we look forward to uh, the collaboration with Co-op and the integration in the office. So let's move to Bonnie um, and the Judicial Council report, please. Thank you. So um, I, uh, my major news is that um, the reason that I think our, the uh, Partnership Grant Committee had to reconsider some of the grants is due to our lower, the filing fees um, are lower than we had initially anticipated, unfortunately. So just to remind the commission, from the equal access side, there are some um, general funds that are allocated um, and they're divided between the IOLTA formula funds and then partnership grant funds. And that's about $18 million. And then, and roughly, uh, Two million of that is for um, uh, partnership grants, and um, we have project that. So that that money stayed the same, which was great. As you may remember, I, we when the budget first came out from the governor, the May revise, there was a ten percent decrease that um, was eliminated. So that was really great news. Uh, the challenge is more on the funding side, on the, the um, filing side. So oh, anytime a civil case is filed, $4.80 goes into the Equal Access Fund. And then that is, again, distributed to the programs, um, obviously not in cases where there's a fee waiver. The challenge is that uh, given the 
any number of factors, but certainly um, the moratoriums and closures and things like that, filing fees are, are not um, needing projections as one can imagine. Um, when we're not taking cases in, we don't collect those filing fees. And so um, it's always challenging and, and it's going to be particularly difficult on courts because they rely in part on those fees. But we um, went back and, and the finance people made their best guess um, on our side that we would be looking at a roughly $2 million cut um, this year in fees from the 5 million um, that we normally anticipate. And so um, working with State Bar staff, we thought it would be safest to go with a lower grant allocation this year. So we're not in a position of saying we're going to be able to give you this money and then we can't fulfill that promise. Um, obviously, if the money comes in, which we hope it will, um, that will be available for distribution next year. We'll just put that into the, um, that'll be part of the contract. So that will be clear. But uh, it's a nerve, any kind of just like the challenge with um, interest rates, it's a little nerve wracking. Um, it's also really nerve wracking right now in terms of what we would anticipate filing fees to look like. So that's that's my report. Not, not the happiest, but um, at least uh, not a huge cut. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Um, Selena? Bonnie, can I just add, um, just oh, sure. off of what Bonnie's update, um, you know, because it, we have been messaging um, to programs that um, the filing fees, um, you know, we're, we're keeping a, an eye on it. So next week when we release the, uh, the budget allocation, we'll definitely point out that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the drop in the EF funding. And we, we did the math and it's about an 11% um, drop in the EF portion, unfortunately. Any other comments or questions related to Bonnie's report? I guess I, I don't remember if I um, also reported, we did um, with the Shriver grant applications or the Shriver project, we did um, submit our report to the legislature on June 30th, um, which indicates the real value of providing legal assistance. And so I can make that available. So you will all have an opportunity to take a look at that. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, Selena, your LAC report. I'm ready to go. Um, so in addition to all the projects that we currently are working on with the State Bar and Judicial Council, um, you know, a lot of trainings and convenings and work on recruitment and retention, um, I just wanted to highlight two quick things I thought would be interest to, uh, of interest to this commission. One of them is that we are continuing to, uh, to continue to track and advocate for a continued eviction moratorium with the legislature. Since the Judicial Council has um, kicked it back to the legislature to fix the problem, we are advocating for continued eviction moratorium um, we are also advocating for increased funding for legal services as part of that. Um, we understand that when that tsunami does come or when that wave of eviction does come, um, there'll be many of people who never thought they would ever need an attorney and people who are living in poverty for the first time who may just need help to navigate a system when they are currently in crisis themselves. Um, even if in better days they could do everything via self-help and they could um, understand these forms themselves, I think that right now there do need to be more helpers. So that's what we're advocating for with the legislature. Um, and then a related issue is that we continue to train legal aid attorneys. Um, the state bar, we have a re relationship with the state bar where we do training for legal aid attorneys. And um, in the past, back when we did in-person events, we did we had an amazing relationship with the National Institute for Trial Advocacy Skills, so with NIDA. Um, many of you may have taken part in a NIDA training yourself. Um, these are for parents, trial advocacy skills training that we've been doing for a little over, well, almost two years now for legal aid or, uh, organizations, either free or very, very greatly reduced um, prices. The sticker price for these is close to $3,000 per person. So if you're a private firm attorney wanting to do this four-day training, it could cost your firm $3,000. And legal aid organizations don't necessarily have those funds available for their attorneys. So um, we actually, I'm just very happy to report that we're continuing to work with NIDA we did a four-day training back in July um, via Zoom, and we're doing another training in September. It's going to be four days, four Fridays in a row, still very intense um, trial skills training, but it's going to be via Zoom. And they also talk some about 
um, how you do remote hearings. So with the assumption that many of these attorneys will be doing Zoom hearings or, or video remote hearings, how do you um, present evidence or, or present yourself via those video Zooms um, without cats like my cat jumping in? Um, but so, so I'm just happy to report that because we know that attorneys are going to need more training. This is a time where they can really um, improve their skills and get ready for trials that will come forward. And we have definitely the September one on the books and we're hoping to plan one more before the end of the calendar year. And that's my report. Thank you, Selena. Any questions or comments? Selena? Um, this is Bob Plantrell. Yeah, excuse me for Selena. I know it's probably something we can't directly address within our scope, but um, when we talk about evictions, various TV news stories also indicate the potential problem of a small landlord who rents out one or two units and uses that to pay a mortgage. Would any eviction defense activities also allow for a small landlord to seek redress from the uh, mortgage holder, the bank, to foreclose because the landlord isn't getting rent paid and yet the landlord himself is a senior or somebody with limited income uh, outside of whatever they might have gotten from rent. Can small landlords be eligible also for any of this eviction defense, even though it's not eviction? Bob, I'm really happy you asked that question because I should have brought that up in advance. Um, with the 31 million in, in the mortgage foreclosure settlement funds that this, this um, body will be distributing, there's a much larger amount of 300 million that's available for mortgage assistance. And it's, it was originally intended for homeowners, but it's been expanded to include landlords with a small number of properties. So this would be an, you know, lower income landlords, um, landlords, I believe the number is five units or less. So it really is folks like, like my neighbor who owns three properties and it's their retirement income. Um, and so that funding is available for that purpose. And if Lauren Klein is on the phone, she actually, I don't know if she's let um, Bonnie and Duan know, but we are reaching out to the agency that's distributing those funds because because we want to specifically, Lauren, do you want to weigh in? I don't want to steal your thunder because it's your project. Sure. Yeah, I'm here. Um, we just started talking to the California Housing Finance Board about their plans as they are um, recipients of a bunch of the funding um, through the bill. And they're still forming their, their plans much as, as we are still doing. But um, I raised that issue with them specifically um, that you know, legal aid is not serving these small landlords, but they're, they're people that need help too. So that's on their radar and those conversations are ongoing um, so that we can keep each other in the loop as we make our plans for the funds. Thank you. And I think that ideally what we hope to have is if someone comes to legal aid or if they come to the courts and they're, they're needing help with an eviction order, and they somehow can identify that, they're, that they know their landlord is a, is a smaller landlord. Um, many of them may know that because they know it's not a corporation, it's just an individual. That there's a way that, that um, either the courts or legal aid can say, oh, you know, as part of this process, you know, we can inform the landlord of this, of this funding available. Um, we, it's kind of like a little bit of the no wrong door. We understand that, that low income people or people who are newly low income who cannot pay rent, there's someone on the other end who is needing that money to pay a mortgage. And so we're trying to figure out the best way to coordinate. I don't think it's going to be especially easy, but, but we're, we're thinking about that and we're trying to trouble through the issue. That, that would be great because often the self-help center in the county is the only place mm -hmm. where a low-income landlord can get assistance or someone who has, for example, let somebody stay in their house at no charge um, mm -hmm. and then can't get them out. <laughs> They're still considered a landlord um, for these cases. So um, so I think that's actually the, the self-help group met, uh, meets every week and that's one of the topics for that they were discussing this afternoon is how to address the needs both of tenants and of those landlords. So I think all the coordination we can do will be really helpful because um, we also know that the law is going to be extremely complicated. Los Angeles has a what used to be a seven page attachment to their answer in an unlawful detainer case and that we've programmed into a hot dogs computer system and they've just asked us to update it and it's now 14 pages. Wow. And so um, I can only imagine <laughs> how challenging it's going to be for anybody 
um, on either side to figure that out. So um, I think I think the need for um, legal help and frankly legal help that actually knows this area of law that's all of a sudden become even more complicated um, will be really important. Thank you, Selena, and thank you, Bonnie, for that addition. The coordination is going to be key. I mean, this is um, it's, it's quite an undertaking. So before we adjourn, I just wanted to, as a friendly uh, reminder, mm -hmm. though we our next uh, meeting is scheduled for the 13th of November, there, there could be additional meetings, ad hoc meetings between now and then. Of course, we have all of our subcommittee meetings, um, so we will all still be busy. Um, but the next time that uh, this group is scheduled to be back together again is on the 13th of November. And um, just one last uh, thank you to all of those who were terming out and um, have accepted an additional year with us so that we can maintain the continuity, um, maintain the, the, the legacy knowledge that we right now have um, as, as to what we're uh, embarking upon. And, um, and again, if I may, Eric, um, on your behalf and myself, uh, thank you for the commission for uh, trusting us for an additional year to lead this body. Um, I feel like we're, we're ending a term, but really not. <laughs> Just gearing up for um, what's about to come for this additional year and couldn't imagine doing it with a better group of people than you all. So thank you. Um, Will has a, uh, one more comment that he'd like to make before we adjourn. Actually, it just turned into two because I forgot something. If you know anyone who has not done the census, it's so important. Please do the census. Please make sure your friends do the census. It's, it's important in calculations for funding. And, and I'm sure this, this group knows it. I'm trying to remind my friends. I just wanted to put that out there. And then on uh, the homeless prevention grants, in my never ending quest to be brief, I, uh, I don't, didn't want to leave the impression that uh, I, I was casting doubt on the work done by others. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the vast majority of my concerns are due to my own ignorance on this complicated process. And I'm gonna dig in more and hopefully uh, uh, gain a deeper understanding and maybe get more suggestions. But I, uh, everyone I've interacted with thus far has been really intelligent about this and working hard. And I don't wanna leave that in impression out there. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, Thank Will. You. And, um, you. and your voice is an important one. Um, so please keep, keep it loud here among us. Uh, we, we encourage it. All right. If there aren't any other comments or questions at this point, um, Bob, you usually are the one that moves us <laughs> to adjourn. Yeah, I was going to say so. Move to adjourn. <laughs> All right. Just get formal motion to adjourn. Thank you. Uh, Not debatable. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ella, can you say thank you? Uh, can you wave? Can you wave? Goodbye. Can you wave? Uh, this is my favorite thing. <laughs>